Hi folks, I'm going to do another video here for grailoftruth.com and uh, this video is going to be on Bible prophecy and chronology um, and uh, how, how that relates into uh, both prophecies that have happened in the past and prophecies of things yet to come, uh, particularly with the, uh, the date of the coming of, of the return of Christ. Um, now if you've seen some of my other videos, um, they, I go into chronology a little bit more detail, but I'm going to try to give a little more briefer overview here um, and kind of put together some benchmarks um, to Bible chronology so you can see how I come up with these dates. Um, but I believe that the Bible uh, shows that the, the age of the earth is less than 6,000 years old according to the way that the scriptures have it written out. Um, I don't think you, if you really study that you can come up with uh, um, a period of 10,000 years or anything like that because that, the Bible doesn't show that. Um, that's, that's not when you add up all the dates in it. So um, I'm going to show you where I believe we are in history in terms of Bible chronology and what that means for future events, particularly with the coming of the return of Christ, which I believe is very shortly um, based on what the scriptures show us. So if, again, I, I invite you to take a look at my other videos to, to see how I got into Bible chronology or, or what I come up with Bible chronology. But uh, to start with, I, I have my year of creation based on my interpretation of the scriptures, 3968 to 3967 BC. And I'll explain to you how I came up with that. Um, I, I, there are, we can add up most of the dates in the Bible um, in chunks, if you will, um, fairly simply by looking at different scriptures. Like, for example, adding up the ages of the, of the patriarchs in Genesis will give us a large chunk of time. Uh, we have another scripture um, in, in the time of Solomon uh, that says that in the fourth year of his reign, the temple was started, and it was started 480 years after the Exodus. So there's another 480-year chunk. Um, so there are, there are different pieces that we can put together to give us large portions of Bible chronology. Uh, the problem lies in the gaps in between and how do they fit together. And, and from there, how do we come up with the accurate years? Now, uh, there are three particular sticking points in Bible chronology um, that I, I think are stumbling block that for most people um, that I'll, I'll go over. But uh, briefly, they, they are, they're the following here. We have um, the, the uh, list of the patriarchs, the ages of the patriarchs in the Septuagint versus those listed in the Masoretic text. And again, these are two uh, codices that are handed down to us from where we get the modern Bible today. Um, the second sticking point would be the time uh, that the Israelites are in bondage in Egypt, uh, which a lot of people believe to be 400 years, some people believe around 250 years. Uh, I believe that the scripture clearly shows it's 300 years, and I'll, I'll explain that in another video as well, um, but that's another major sticking point. And then the, the third sticking point um, would be the, uh, uh, once you know that, you know the Exodus, you can get to the time of Solomon. The, the third sticking point would be then the time from Solomon until the Babylonian captivity, and from the Babylonian captivity until uh, the start of, of uh, the, the uh, excuse me, the, the first coming of Christ, um, which happened uh, around 1 B.C., 1 A.D. So if, if we can get past those areas, then the rest of the scriptures can be uh, pieced together, I believe, to show the accurate chronology. Um, so I'll give you my benchmarks, what I have here, to, and, and then I'll explain those points and how I came up with them. Uh, first of all, I have creation around 3968 to 3967 B.C. And uh, from, from that point um, until uh, the death of Adam is 930 years, and that's clearly laid out in the Masoretic text in, in Genesis. And then uh, about 127 years after that, we have the birth of Noah. Um, now from there, I have 480 years to the start of Noah's Ark. And the reason is uh, because in Genesis chapter 6, um, uh, God says that the, there will be 120 years in the days of man, that his spirit will not only strive with man forever because he's also flesh. I believe that that is talking about the 120 years um, from that point that that decree is given until the time that the flood would just wipe man off the face of the earth. And it was at that time that God told Noah to start building the ark. So what we have here is we have uh, 480 years from the birth of Noah until the start of the ark. And that uh, brings us to about 29, uh, 2918 B.C. And then from the start of the ark, uh, or excuse me, uh, 40, 2431 B.C. for the start of the ark. Excuse me. Uh, now from the start of the ark until the flood, we have 120 years. And I have the flood in 2311 B.C. And here's kind of an interesting another date. Seven years before the flood, uh, Lamech, one of uh, the last people to die before the flood other than Methuselah, um, dies at the age of 777. So there's a nice round biblical date there. Um, from the flood then until the uh, birth of Jacob, I have another 480 years. So we have 480 to the start of the ark, 120 to the flood, and another 480 
to the birth of Jacob, which brings us to 1831 BC. Uh, and then from uh, the birth of Jacob until the time of the Exodus, um, we have uh, 430 years, because I believe, again, that the, there were 300 years of bondage in Egypt. Not all of it was bondage, but the Israelites were there for 300 years. So that brings us to 1401 BC. And uh, from there, we got the date, as I mentioned earlier, of 480 years until the start of uh, Solomon's Temple, uh, as, as outlined in Scripture. So that brings us to 921 BC for the start of the the first temple. Now you have seven years that the temple was constructed, which brings us to 914 BC. And then from there, now we get into a little bit more calculation again. Um, I believe there's two ways you can get to this date. One is by showing the, the dates of the kings, uh, how they correspond to each other in, in the books of Kings and Chronicles. And again, I, I, I've done this and I can show you this as well, but uh, I believe that this will give us the bring us to a date from 914 B.C. all the way down to 494 B.C., thereabouts, for the start of the, the captivity. Uh, the second way we can get to this, too, is because um, we know that the reason for the captivity was that uh, the they were not keeping the Sabbaths. And the temple was destroyed, and then there were 70 years that um, the land was allowed to regain the Sabbaths that were not kept. And the Sabbaths were the sabbatical years where every seventh year, the Israelites were supposed to let the land that they were farming rest, not farm it. Um, they weren't doing this. And so they were taken to captivity, and the land was uh, allowed to rest for 70 years. So from that, we can derive that from the end of the captivity, it had to be 490 years earlier that this problem of not keeping the uh, Sabbath started. Well, that happens to be the time of the start of Solomon's Temple, which is, uh, again, it starts in 914 B.C. So if we go... 490 years, um, we get to 424 B.C. And I'll explain a little more in detail again with how I, I come up with that, um, why that has to be that way in terms of the Sabbaths. So from 424 B.C., uh, we have three and a half years um, before the... the, the it, it, this again goes into the scriptures of Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, when they returned from the captivity, there was a time period where the construction on the new temple was stopped, and then it was started up again in the second year of Darius. I believe this is Darius II, and that that time period is a very short time period, um, about three and a half years. And then from the time period of Darius II until the sixth year of his reign, another three and a half years, um, that, that, that is the point at which the temple then, the second temple is completed. Uh, it was Zerubbabel's temple, if you will, not to be confused with Herod's temple, which is a, a reconstruction of the second temple that was done in the time of Christ. So that, that brings us... Uh, to the prophecy of Daniel in chapter 9, which is the 490 years um, until the destruction of the second temple. So the uh, from 424 uh, BC, 421 BC thereabouts, um, until the, or for, excuse me, 421 BC until the destruction of the temple, second temple, we have another 490 years as prophesied by Daniel. And uh, that brings us to 70 AD, which is the time that the temple was destroyed, the second temple was destroyed under the Romans. Actually, this is the Herod's temple. The, the Zerubbabel's temple was actually destroyed uh, a little bit years earlier um, due to the reconstruction done by Herod, but I can, exp I can explain that also um, in another video. So what we have here then is uh, a total time frame that brings us to around the time of Christ and the crucifixion of Christ, which happened around 33, 34 AD, and then uh, the destruction of the temple, which happened in 70 AD. Um, if you add all these dates up, again, we get approximately 4,000 years from the start of creation until the crucifixion of, of Christ. Uh, so from 3968, 3967 uh, BC to 3334 AD, we have a 4,000 year period. Now, um, I, I also believe that the, there's a, a, the Tower of Babel is about 2,000 years is the midway point between those two periods, but that again is for another video. Um, the from the crucifixion of Christ, then, uh, to the 6,000th year of creation would bring us to about 2032, 2033, which is obviously a future date. Um, so if we look at the way that uh, these paternality, if you will, of, of uh, God's word, um, there's a, a philosophy called dispensationalism, which believes in 6,000 years of creation followed by a 1,000 years of, of Christ based on uh, prophetic... Uh, uh, utterances in the scriptures um, foretelling a coming 4,000 years uh, when Christ returns of peace um, while, he, while he reigns on this earth. 
uh, this is emblematic of the seven years, or excuse me, seven days of creation, the seventh being the day of rest. So you have six days of creation and one se and the seventh day is the day of rest. You have 6,000 years of creation and then a thousand year of, of uh, reign of Christ, which is the time of rest. Um, so there's that paternality again, if you will. But there are other paternalities that go along with this too. For example, um, the, uh, the time that from Jacob, who was Israel, God changed his name to Israel, and he became the nation of Israel. All of his descendants are the nation of Israel. From the time that, that Jacob was born until he went to get his wife, uh, wives, I should say, um, he, he left at, at the age of 77 um, and uh, went to Laban, um, uh, his daughters, in order to, to get a wife in Rachel. And Laban told him that he had to work for him for seven years in order to receive Rachel as a wife. So Jacob worked for seven years, and then at the age of 84, uh, Laban tricked him and gave him his other daughter, Leah, as his wife instead. And uh, But he said, hey, if you work for me another seven years, I'll give you Rachel as well. So he did. And so Jacob buried both Leah and Rachel and then worked another seven years, and then an additional six years after that for his cattle. So he, in all total, he spent 20 years uh, working for Laban. Now, uh, this was a time of affliction for, for Jacob, for Israel. And he, it was described as such um, in the naming of his children. Uh, this is the start of the affliction that's outlined um, in a prophecy given to Abraham, in my opinion. And so uh, the reason why I'm talking about this in terms of paternality is because if we look at the rebirth of the nation of Israel, and again, Jacob is Israel, uh, the, the modern Israel was reborn again in 1948. So uh, if we look at the pattern of when Jacob left to go get his bride and compared that to say Jesus returning for his bride which is the church um, in, in, in the Christ coming in uh, coming again in the second coming um, if if we look at that paternality based on the timeline of Jacob's life and compare it to modern Israel um, 77 years would bring us to uh, in the in the age of modern Israel would bring us to the year 2025 and then of course um, that's when uh, Jacob went to get his wife, Israel, in, in the ancient times. And then uh, after seven years of, of labor, um, he received his wife, but then he had to work another seven years for um, for Rachel. So we have this time of affliction. Now the question is, is the time of affliction or the time of Jacob's trouble, if you will, uh, possibly the allegation of the tribulation, illusion of the tribulation, does that start at age 77 for Jacob or does that start at age 84 when he discovers that uh, he was tricked by Laban and he has to work another seven years and when he starts having kids? So if that's the case, then does Christ begin to return for his bride at 20, year 2025 or 2032, 2033, somewhere in there instead? And then that's the start of the seven-year tribulation? Good question. Um, if, if that paternality holds true, either way, it would suggest that the return of Christ is imminent in, in our generation and that the time of the tribulation period, the seven-year tribulation, is also coming very soon. Now keep in mind that period of 2032 to 2033 again is 6,000 years um, after creation. So all of this begins to tie in together, um, and that's kind of the point I wanted to get to in terms of Bible prophecy. Now I'm going to go into a little bit um, about uh, uh, well, I'll, first of all, I'll go over some sticking points on Bible prophecy so that you can kind of see how I came up with this. Uh, the, these are the three keys, if you will, that uh, I think the, most people overlook or, or aren't aware of, perhaps, when they're trying to add up uh, um, the dates of the Bible. Again, mo most of the dates with little elbow, elbow grease uh, and some puzzle work can be put together, but these points are, are very important. One is that um, the, uh, the time period for uh, uh, the patriarchs has to include a figure called Canaan, which is uh, in the Septuagint text. And uh, Kenan is, uh, um, he's also listed in the, uh, uh, the Masoretic text uh, in the New Testament, in the genealogy of Christ, but he's not listed in the Old Testament. There may be a reason for this. He might have been the start of, some conjectures, the start of astrology, and therefore there's a commandment to blot out his name out of the book because of uh, evil ways or something of that nature. Um, but the fact remains that he is in the Septuagint Old Testament, and he is in the genealogy of Christ in both the uh, Masoretic and the Septuagint. 
So I, I have no problem with there being a contradiction in terms of the Septuagint and the Masoretic because I believe in the mouth of two or more witnesses, the truth is established. And in my reading of the scripture, I think there are actually um, a lot of the, the way scripture is written is it's purposely put to portray what looks like contradictions uh, so that you can get at the bigger truth. And usually when I find a contradiction, I'm very happy because um, it finding the solution to that contradiction reveals great truths within the Bible. I believe it's actually purposely written that way in many instances um, so that you have to seek it out because it's the glory of God to hide a matter, it's the glory of a king to, to discover it. Um, so, anyways, uh, and I think the first three chapters um, kind of show how this process works. Um, uh, but anyways, the uh, Kenan has to be um, added because he's in the Septuagint and he's in the genealogy of Jesus. Um, but the question is how many years do we add for Kenan? Now, I believe that the Masoretic does have the correct uh, years uh, for all the other patriarchs, um, and that the Septuagint makes, uh, they, they seem to add 100 years uh, in most instances for the patriarchs, which I think is an error. I believe the Septuagint has the, the correct years for that. Um, but the the question then is, how many years do we add for Kenan? Uh, and this isn't the same, different Kenan or Canaan than, than the one that's uh, listed um, already in the Masoretic. Uh, but how many years do we add for this particular patriarch? Um, from the time of his birth until the time of the birth of his son, because that has to be added to the overall chronology of the Bible. And uh, because the Septuagint tends to add 100 years um, to all the patriarchs versus the Masoretic, uh, it shows that there's 130 years in the Septuagint from the birth of Kenan until the till his son. So therefore, in the Masoretic, it must be 30 years, and that's where I come up with that date. So I believe that if you're going to do uh, Bible chronology in terms of adding up the patriarchs in Genesis, one thing you have to do is you have to add 30 years for this particular patriarch because he is found in the New Testament, he is found in the Septuagint, um, in the uh, and in the um, lineage of Christ. So therefore, uh, I believe he has to be added. That's sticking point number one. Now, from there, you can you can add up all the dates and you can get chronology with a little elbow grease and puzzle work, as I said, all the way up till Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there, you have to go into a little bit more puzzle work. Um, but where you really run into trouble is uh, in the uh, time that the uh, Israelites were in Egypt. And again, some people, most people would say it's 400 years, um, some would say it's 250, I believe it's clearly 300, and I have another video that explains why that is. Um, but the mistake, briefly, uh, the reason why people make the mistake of 400 years um, is because of a prophecy that's given to Abraham, and, and I'll go over that real quick. Now this is found in Genesis chapter 15, starting at verse 13. Uh, God's talking to Abraham about the covenant that he's making with him, and he says, uh, and he said to, unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Um, now, most people take that to refer to the time of their bondage in Egypt, because certainly the Israelites were slaves for a period of time in Egypt. Um, however, they were certainly not slaves the entire time they were in Egypt, because uh, Joseph uh, was actually the second in command under Pharaoh for many years, and it wasn't until after uh, the death of Joseph that another Pharaoh rose that knew not Joseph, um, that uh, the uh, Israelites entered into a period of bondage. And I believe in the, the historical record of this shows, um, shows this occurring in the, uh, what's called the expulsion of the Hyksos, um, which uh, actually shows the, the time period, not of the Exodus, but the time period where uh, the uh, Israelites, which were in control or had, had gained great power under Joseph and that, that Pharaoh, were then uh, overthrown and turned into slaves uh, and many of them were even chased out and, and killed, but the rest were all turned into slaves uh, under another pharaoh, and then it was um, the rest of that time that they served in bondage while they were in Egypt. But again, this is not a 400-year period, because uh, for a good portion of that time, they were actually uh, the rulers of Egypt. This is the Hyksos dynasty. Um, so anyways, the, uh, the, the uh, time in Egypt was 300 years, um, according to my uh, understanding of uh, Bible prophecy and chronology and so forth. Um, because the, the, the birth of Jacob um, to the time that he entered into Egypt is 130 years according to the scriptures. And uh, the, uh, the time that they left Egypt uh, was 430 years after the confirmation of the covenant. And I believe that Jacob, or Israel, is the confirmation of the covenant um, that, uh, that the promise that God gave to uh, uh, Abraham and that uh, Jacob would receive the land and so forth. Um, but again, if we go back to this prophecy, in regards to the 400 years of affliction, I don't believe it's talking about the time uh, that the Israelites are in Egypt. And it says, He said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger to land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. 
Well, uh, when Jacob entered into Egypt, he said he was a sojourner and, and uh, uh, he had not yet attained to the days of his father. They were a stranger, Jacob and Israel, um, even Abraham and Isaac were all strangers in a land that wasn't theirs. The Israelites did not get the land of Canaan until uh, the seventh year of, of Joshua, after the seven-year conquest of Canaan, um, which was, uh, uh, Joshua began his conquest 40 years after the Exodus. So um, it was it was the seventh year of Joshua that was the end of their 40 years of being strangers in a land that wasn't theirs. That was when they got the land. So if uh, if Joshua <clears throat> starts um, uh, the end of the 400 years, uh, and, and Joshua got the land uh, 47 years after the Exodus, um, then the Exodus, at the time in Egypt, was not obviously 400 years. Um, now, again, Jacob began, uh, um, Jacob is the confirmation of the covenant. Jacob was born 130 years before he went into Egypt. They, they were there for 300 years, so we have 430 years, and the Bible says that they came out uh, of the Exodus 430 years after the confirmation of the covenant, even that self same day. So the day that they came out of the Exodus was Jacob's birthday, um, which is important in, in terms of Bible prophecy, but I can get into that later on. Uh, so the, the uh, again, getting back to the prophecy given here in, in uh, Genesis chapter 15, um, it says, Abraham said, No, surely that I see it shall be a stranger in a land that is not near theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. So uh, Jacob... Um, is a stranger in a land that's not theirs. Now, he would serve them and he would be afflicted. This is very important because when Jacob was uh, 77 years old, um, and again, this is not the same as the 430 year prophecy that I just, or 430 year timeline that I discussed earlier. When Jacob was uh, 77 years old, uh, he went to get his wife uh, back in Haran, which is the country that Abraham originally came out of, um, from one of his relatives named Laban. And uh, he was going to marry one of, he ended up marrying uh, two of his daughters, actually. Um, but when Jacob went back to get his wife, he was 77 years old, and he was put into service at that point in time. And he had to serve seven years for what he thought was going to be his wife, Rachel. But Laban tricked him and gave him his older daughter, Leah, instead. And then Jacob had to work another seven years in order to get Rachel for a wife. And this was uh, a time of affliction or a time of trouble for Jacob, Jacob's trouble, if you will. Um, because he, uh, uh, for for seven years, he had to, he had to work for the wrong wife, if you will, um, and then uh, uh, Laban continually tried to trick him and tried to keep Jacob in his service and in his bondage. Jacob ended up working another six years after that for a total of twenty years, fourteen for the wives and six for more for for cattle, uh, before he was able to actually leave. Um, so if we look at this prophecy here again, it says that. Uh, Jacob would be a, uh, or that uh, Noah of surety that thy seed would be a stranger land that's not theirs, and that they shall afflict them for 400 years, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards uh, shall they come out with great substance. So um, the time of the affliction, this is the 400 years of affliction, starts when uh, Jacob goes in, into bondage for Laban in order to get his wives. Um, it was 400 years after that point that the Israelites got the land in uh, uh, Canaan, according to Bible chronology. Uh, so again, this all fits together. Now it says that, uh, again, to continue on here to show why this can't be referring to the bondage in Egypt, it says that the nation whom they shall serve, after I will judge afterwards, and that nation, by the way, is Babylon, because that's where Abraham originally came out of. Haran was part of the Babylonian ki uh, kingdom. Um, also, that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards they shall come out with great substance. Jacob came out of uh, Laban, 20 years with great, after 20 years of service with great substance. Um, and then it goes on to say that, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, so Abraham was going to be buried um, in a good old age, and then in the fourth generation that they would come hither again. So the, here's the point that really shows that this can't be uh, talking about the time in, in uh, Egypt, um, is that uh, Jacob comes out of somewhere with great substance, um, and then he goes away, and four generations later, he comes back. So this can't be referring to the time of the Exodus because after four generations in the time of the Exodus is when they came out with great substance. Yet this prophecy is saying that he would first come out with great substance, disappear for four generations, and then come back to the land. So therefore, it must be talking about the time of Laban. And, and also, uh, again, this is the 400 years for the time of affliction. Um, the naming of Jacob's children show that this was a time of affliction. For Jacob at the start of his trouble. So again, why, I'm, I'm getting at that because this is prophetic 
of the uh, coming of Christ, um, because the modern nation of Israel was born in 1948, um, at age 77 is the year 2025, and if Christ should return for his bride or go to get his bride, which is the church at that time, um, then we may have the start of the seven-year tribulation at that time frame. Or, again, depending on the interpretation here, uh, if the tribulation starts for the seven years that Jacob worked for Rachel, um, then that would start around 2032 or 2033, which is 2,000 years after the uh, crucifixion of Christ and 6,000 years after creation, um, which would, again, start the 1,000-year uh, reign of peace. So either way, like I said, we, we have uh, dates here that show that uh, the coming of Christ is imminent and probably within our lifetime. Um, so that's the second point of chronology that we need to get to. Now, once we get to that point and we know the date for, for the Exodus, which is for around 1401 B.C., from there, we can quickly get to the start of the temple, because the temple starts um, 480 years, according to uh, scripture, after the Exodus. And I'll show you that scripture as well. Uh, it's uh, chapter uh, 6 of 1 Kings, verse 1, and it says, And it came to pass in the 480th year, after the children of Israel were come out of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign of Israel, in the month of Ziph, uh, which is the second, um, the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. So the start of the temple, again, there's a, a nice swath of time we're able to piece together in Bible chronology of 480 years, uh, happens uh, after uh, 480 years after the time of the Exodus, which, again, I, I showed was 1401 B.C., so 480 years brings us to uh, 921 uh, B.C. And then it goes on to say that the temple was uh, constructed for seven years, um, which brings us to uh, uh, 914 B.C., and then he spent another 13 years building uh, his palace um, after that. Now, the, the reason why this is significant, getting back into um, the, the time of the captivity, which is our third sticking point in Bible chronology, um, is because we need to be able to piece together the reigns of the kings until the captivity from that point, and then from the kings, on, or the captivity until the restoration of the temple, um, and all the way until the uh, time of Christ. And this, this is, really becomes quite complex, but we can do this by piecing together um, the ages of the kings. And I've actually done that. Um, uh, I've put together a spreadsheet, and I, I won't go over all the details. I'll, I'll reserve that for another video for the sake of brevity and time here. Um, but I've actually uh, pieced together um, all the kings and their relation to their dates and how they tie into one each other. And again, it does lead to this uh, time frame that I give in my Bible chronology. But this isn't the only way that I uh, come up with that particular date. And you can do this by piecing together the kings of, uh, of uh, Israel, uh, which is the northern kingdom, versus the, the timelines of the uh, kings of Judah, um, which is the southern kingdom that uh, Israel divided into these two kingdoms uh, due to a civil war. Um, but from doing this, we can put together a chronology that will show the, the times of the reigns of the kings all the way up until the time of the captivity. And again, it leads us to the same date, which is around uh, the 490s of uh, B.C. for the start of the captivity. So, uh, again, I, I won't go through this in too great detail. Um, one point I want to make is that I think there's a serious error uh, in the chronology that's um, given for the uh, uh, period called the Achaemenid period um, and the Bab Neo-Babylonian period, which is very important because what had happened here is um, this gets into the, the prophecies in the book of Daniel. Uh, one moment here. Okay, so the... Um, the book of Daniel uh, alludes to, in, in different prophecies, the kingdoms of the world that would come throughout time. And the first kingdom that it talks about is the kingdom of the Babylonians. And then uh, um, from them, the, uh, the Medo persians empire would take over, and they would rule the world for a certain period of time. And then from them, uh, the uh, Alexander the Great would come along, uh, and the Greeks, and he would take over the world, but his kingdom would be divided into four parts. And uh, out of the one of those parts would raise the rise the Roman Empire, which is this fourth terrible beast that would take over the world. And he, the Roman Empire, would then stand up against the Prince of the Covenant, who is Jesus. Um, and uh, um, he would, uh, they would overthrow the temple and destroy it. And uh, but then the, the saints would take the kingdom, um, and it would, that kingdom would last forever and ever and ever. And this is all outlined in the Book of Daniel. And uh, the Book of Daniel, by the way, um, very interesting prophetic book, but 
this is one of the books that was found in the in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which um, again dates to before the time of Christ or shortly after the birth of Christ, but before the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. So we have confirmation of prophecies that talk about the future for events that, come, that have come to pass um, that we clearly know those particular texts existed before those events came to pass, which is one of the great points that proves the Bible. Um, but uh, getting back to the point of the, this, this sticking point of, uh, of the uh, time frame of the Achaemenids and the Babylonians, the Achaemenids being the Medo Persians, that's, that's the uh, academic name for them. Um, the uh, Medo Persian Empire and the, the Babylonians uh, is a very confused time period, a very difficult time period to, to piece together. And this is the time period that I believe that the uh, historical record right now has pieced together inaccurately. And this, is, is, this creates great problems with the book of Daniel um, because the book of Daniel, unlike many other prophecies in the Bible, which are open-ended prophecies, um, the book of Daniel uh, has prophecies that have specific time uh, constraints to them. Um, so in order for the prophecy to be fulfilled, it has to be fulfilled within a certain period of time, um, unlike many other prophecies which are open-ended. So uh, if we don't know when these prophecies start, then we can't find an accurate fulfillment for when they end. So if history has the starting points wrong, or has the chronology of these different kingdoms wrong, and the chronology of the captivity and the, and the chronology of the time of Daniel wrong, then that means that the book of Daniel remains sealed until that can all be um, restructured so that we can find the accurate time. Um, I believe that uh, what I'm going to show here will, will hopefully um, jumble some of that, if you will. So I'm going to go to that in a, in a moment here. Before I get into... Um, the, those prophecies in Daniel, I first have to kind of go over the second way again that uh, we get from the time of the start of the Temple in Solomon until the time of the Babylonian captivity when the Israelites were taken, um, their temple was destroyed and their Jerusalem was destroyed and they were taken into bondage um, for 70 years in Babylon. Um, so that we can get to those those time frames for Daniel. Again, I have 914 B.C. as the, uh, the date of the uh, start, or, or the, excuse me, of the completion of Solomon's Temple after seven years of construction, and then, of course, he spent 13 years um, building his palace. Now, there's no mention of any sabbatical time there, so one of the illusions possibly that could be taken from that is that uh, um, that they weren't celebrating the, the sabbatical years as they were told to in God's law, because every seventh year was supposed to be a year of rest, particularly for the land. Um, so this could be the time that, uh, the start of the time, that uh, they failed to keep the sabbatical years uh, as was prescribed in the law. But at, going back to the law um, that was given to Moses at the time of the Exodus and, and to the nation of Israel, um, there are some important prophecies given there that allude to the coming events that would happen at the time of the Babylonian captivity. Um, and I'm, I'll take this up in Leviticus chapter 26, where God is talking about the different curses and judgments that he would bring upon the nation of Israel if they disobeyed him. And basically he would... Uh, he, God would say, if you don't walk my ways, if you don't obey my commandments, I will do this. And if you continue not to do it, I will do it seven times more. If you continue not to do it, I will do it seven times greater, and so on and so forth. So um, that's the verse I'm going to take up here, starting at uh, verse 28. It says, then, uh, um, okay, verse 27 rather, it says, if you will not do all this and hearken unto me, but walk contrary to me, God speaking to the Israelites here, uh, he says, then I will walk contrary uh, unto you also in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times more for your sins, and you shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters uh, shall ye eat. Uh, I will destroy your high places and cut down your images, cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and your soul, my soul shall abhor you. And I will make your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries unto desolation. And I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors, and I will bring the land uh, into desolation, and your enemies will dwell therein, uh, your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen, uh, and I will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths as long as it uh, lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest upon your Sabbaths when you dwelt upon it. So they, the, the judgment here of being the sanctuary is destroyed and they're, they're being uh, sent into bondage, cast among the other nations into slavery, um, and they were, they, had to, they were eating their children at the time of the siege of Jerusalem because there was no food. That's how bad it got. 
um, uh, all these things that were prophesied at the time of Moses that, that God promised would happen if, they, if the Israelites disobeyed them all came to pass at the time of the Babylonian captivity. Um, but it's the specific verse that I'm referring to here is the, the talking about the land uh, enjoying our Sabbath. Now what was happening is every seven years, um, they weren't supposed to be planting crops and farming the fields. They were supposed to let the fields lie as a form of, of crop rotation because the land was supposed to be enjoying our Sabbath. So they weren't supposed to be doing that kind of work during that seventh year. So um, if, if we calculate 914 as the starting point of uh, uh, the temple, the, the completion of the temple, and we want to add all the years until uh, the captivity um, to figure out how many <clears throat> sabbatical years were missed, we can do that ra rather easily. Um, so what we do here is we have uh, <clears throat> 914, okay, so 914 B.C. is uh, the, when the temple was completed. Now, if the captivity was, was to start, again, I, I went through the list of the kings briefly to show you how I calculate that all up, and, and uh, I came to the conclusion that the captivity starts around um, uh, uh, 420 years after the completion of the temple. So if we subtract 900, uh, 420 years from 914, we come to the year of 494 B.C., thereabouts. So 420 years is the time period from the completion of the temple until the start of the captivity. Now we can confirm this again with the sabbatical years because 420 years um, that they should have been working the, the uh, should have been letting the land rest every seventh year. Uh, if we divide that by seven, because every seven years they got to let the land rest, that means there are a total of 60 uh, years that were worked that the land should have been allowed to rest during that 420 year period. Now you might be saying to yourself, well wait a minute, the the uh, uh, the captivity lasted 70 years to allow the land to rest. Why why didn't it last 60 if that's the case? Well keep in mind those 60 years that they, uh, um, during that 420 that the, they were working the land, those years itself are work years and the land deserves Sabbath rests for those 60 that they worked that they shouldn't have. So um, the 60 years that they worked that should have been sabbatical years we have to attribute one uh, Sabbath year per every six years worked. So therefore, there's an additional 10 years of Sabbath years that need to be added on here. So um, if that makes sense, so we have a total of 70 years, once we add those, those 10 on for the 60 that were worked, that the land deserves 70 years of rest. So there's the 70 years of, of, uh, of captivity that the Israelites would be taken out of the land when the land enjoys their Sabbath, and then 70 years later they'd be brought back. So again, if we start those 70 years, um, after, uh, 420 years after 914 B.C., that means that the uh, start of the um, captivity starts around 494 B.C. Well, in 494 B.C., based on my chronology, that's uh, year 23 of, uh, of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign, based on uh, my reading of the uh, historical record, and I'll get into why how I come up with that. Um, it's not the, the 600s and 500s uh, B.C. that uh, most historians would suggest, um, and I'll explain why it cannot be that, um, and why the vast majority of their record from that period is completely wrong. Um, so anyways, 494 B.C., uh, for that particular year, if we start the Sabbath at that, at that time, or the... the uh, captivity at that time frame, that would bring us 70 years later to 424 B.C., and 424 B.C. is the uh, last reign of a king called Artaxerxes, um, and uh, at that time he has three sons that vie for the throne um, around the time that he dies, or shortly beforehand. Um, one is by the name of Sogdianus, um, the other is uh, takes the name throne name of Xerxes, Xerxes I, um, I'm sorry, Xerxes the second, rather. And then uh, the, the third one, which actually ends up winning out, he is Darius the second, and he's the one who, who maintains the, uh, the throne for, for quite some time. And it is the second year of his reign that the temple, construction of the temple, is restarted. This is a very short time period that these kings are vying for the throne. So the, uh, in the book of Daniel, um, this is the period during Artaxerxes, Xerxes, and Darius, that all these letters are taking place and the, the construction of the temple is being stopped. These, these are a matter of months, not years, um, while all these kings are vying for power um, before Darius wins out and construction of the temple restarts again. But it is um, around the end of the, the 
reign of Artaxerxes and the beginning of the reign of uh, Darius that the captivity ends. And part of the problem in reading the script book of Daniel, and I'll get into this when I go into the scriptures itself a little bit more detail, um, is that many people tend to think that this time period, because it talks about these three kings and the temple construction of the temple stopping, that it must be a vast amount of time because it's all these days. But in fact, it's not. It's actually a very short amount of time during the, the period of these kings that the t construction of the temple stops from the time that they um, leave the captivity until uh, the time that the construction of the temple is restarted. Um, and I'll explain again why this has to be and why scripture clearly shows it has to be this and why this is a misunderstanding uh, on, on the part of a lot of people um, that this period is a lot longer than it actually is. So getting back into uh, um, 494 BC, uh, piecing together the Babylonian time period and the, or, or, and the Achaemenid or Medo-Persian time period is probably the biggest uh, structural drawback to coming to the final conclusion of the, the chrono chronological puzzle. Once you have that piece together, um, then we can rely on the prophecies in the, the book of Daniel and in traditional um, historical record from that point on to get to the time of the reign of Christ and uh, um, know where we are in history. And obviously 2,000 years from that point, it's, it's very, history becomes a lot more easier to record um, to know where, what year we're in, if you will. So um, that's what gets us to the year uh, 6,000, or roughly, that's coming up very shortly. And the possible um, potential second advent of Christ. So one of the big sticking points now that I, I want to discuss in terms of Bible prophecy and chronology um, for the Babylonian period is this idea that uh, Nebuchadnezzar's reign and the Neo-Babylonian reigns is much further back in history than it actually is and the Neo-Assyrians and so forth. Um, there were, uh, to understand what was going on at that time, you had different empires that were vying for power. And uh, they each controlled kingdoms, and the kingdoms were various city-states, if you will, and they had rulers. And, and generally the heads of uh, the way this was handed down traditionally is going all the way back to the Tower of Babel. Um, it was the firstborn son uh, of any particular family or clan that had the, uh, uh, inherited the authority uh, to rule over that family or that house. Um, and then uh, should he die, it would pass on to the next-born son and so forth, but it, it went in that order. It's a very uh, unusual thing for uh, a lesser-born son to assume the, the throne or the head of that household um, because that was a right that was given to the first-born son. Now, in the Bible, uh, Jacob, who was Israel, was the second-born son, but uh, God had prophesied that this, the younger son would be the one that would inherit these rights. And it, it talks about, um, in, in the life of Jacob, how... Uh, this was accomplished. Um, he received not only the the, the birthright, which was the, the right of the firstborn son, um, from over Esau, because Esau sold it to him for a bowl of porridge, of all things, um, but uh, he also received the blessing later on, which, or the inheritance or the, the proclamation of, of, uh, of, of the blessing from, from his father um, that uh, Esau thought he was going to get. So not only he got the authority, but he also got the inheritance, if you will, or the, or the, the prophesied blessing that um, uh, was prescribed um, for the elder son. The, the, the second son, Jacob, uh, received it. But traditionally, historically, it's always the firstborn that's supposed to receive the inherit the throne and receive the blessing. So these uh, firstborn actually became these the, the, the head of the kin, if you will. These became the kings of the different... Uh, cities that grew in the, in the households and the families, one of these being the great house, which is Pharaoh, who became the king of Egypt. And you, from that, you had different empires that, that grew up when these, these cities uh, grew and, and uh, linked together, formed together to, be, to form uh, nations, if you will. One of these was the Neo-Assyrian Empire, which was in the northern part of Iraq. And they ruled out of their capital in a place called Nineveh. Uh, another one was the Hittite, which is a little further towards uh, Turkey and so forth, and, and uh, Assyria and so forth. Um, and then uh, the Babylonian, which was uh, central Iraq for the most part, um, was another major empire. Uh, and then you had the Egyptian Empire, and then of course you had the Israelites, who were um, uh, in uh, along the Mediterranean coast. Um, and then of course you had the, the nations, the Gentiles, the Greeks, which were in Greece. Um, and then uh, you had the... Uh, Indian Empire and so forth, uh, which was out uh, along the Indus Valley. Um, so all these different empires grew up um, with, with their own kings, running all their own cities and so forth. 
Um, but the Bible says that uh, there was one particular king by the name of Nimrod, who was a mighty hunter before the Lord, a uh, conqueror, and he went through and created the first global empire. Uh, he was a son of, uh, of Cush, who was a son of Ham, who was one of the sons of Noah. And he, was, he created the first empire that became to be known the Babylonian Empire, and it was out of this Babylonian Empire that Abraham uh, left uh, because God instructed him to um, sometime after the uh, Tower of Babel. And um, from there, Abraham went down into a land that was not his, and God promised to give him that land. Um, that land became the nation of Israel and the land of Israel, but not before a lot of things happened. Abraham went down to Egypt for some time. Um, his descendants under Jacob, they went into bondage in Egypt, um, and then uh, were uh, under Moses uh, came out in the, in the Exodus in the fourth generation. And uh, uh, they went and conquered the land of Canaan, which uh, the Canaanites were sons of Ham. Uh, they went and conquered that land, and uh, from there they started the nation of Israel, which is the prophesied nation, and uh, God gave them the books of the Bible under Moses and so forth, and all the way down through the prophets up to this day. And, of course, we know the history to that point, uh, even to the coming of the Messiah, who is Jesus Christ. So um, getting back to the, po the, the point I'm, why I'm talking about this, um, to understand the, the, the global empire and the history of the world, you really have to understand the clash of civilizations between God's promised people uh, and his word handed down through the Israelites, which was set apart a special nation that he took out of Babylon, and the rest of the world, which is basically the progeny of, of Babylon. And, and the book of Daniel talks about these kingdoms, because here's, here's what happened in history. Um, Nimrod, uh, he, he inherited the kingship, and he started the great, first great global empire. Um, there were other empires around him, smaller ones, but the Babylonian Empire is the empire that won out, and it became the head, the chief, the first empire uh, that ruled the world. Um, the other empires, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, and so forth, what they would do is they play kind of a game of thrones, if you will, in that they would try to get the other kingdoms, they would go to war with, against them, and they try to get them to bow down and pay tribute. And oftentimes they would allow, in many cases, to be continue to be kings over their particular cities or, or lands as long as they bowed down and agreed to serve or pay tribute to a greater king who uh, assumed the title of the King of Kings. Um, and this was the emperor. Uh, that was the head of all the different kings. So um, there was there was these battles all the time from uh, every year um, as these kings fought each other to try to assume control over uh, each other's nations and and pay tribute and so forth. And uh, and many different times in in the historical record of Israel, um, there were there were wars going on where oftentimes the kings of Israel ended up paying tribute and serving different kings of these nations. And the pro Israel was. Part of the problem with, with uh, the, the location of Israel in terms of this whole battle structure that was going on is that Israel was between many of these great empires, particularly Egypt to the south and the Assyrians and the Babylonians, which would come along the Fertile Crescent down through Israel to fight Egypt, or vice versa. Uh, Egypt would come up through Israel to fight them. Uh, so Israel oftentimes found themselves in the middle between the king of the north or the king of the south, and uh, they were sometimes the battleground between those two. Um, or what would happen is, as the kings would pass through the area, they would fight for a time with Israel and, and try to uh, put them into bondage or, or cause them to pay tribute. So, uh, anyways, getting back to the point, uh, uh, between these the, the two histories of the world, the Babylonian history and the Israeli history, which came out of Babylon through, through Abraham, um, all the nations of this world, other than Israel, which was set apart specifically um, by God, all the nations of this world are progenitors or, or inheritors of that first kingdom, if you will, of, of Babylon, because Babylon first conquered the world and created the first global empire. Um, what later happened was the Babylonians were conquered by the Medo Persians, um, which was a, a, an empire of two tribes, the, the Medes and the Persians, that joined together. Um, and they're the ones who ended up actually uh, freeing one of their kings, uh, Cyrus, ended up freeing. Um, the the uh, it, uh, Israelites from captivity so that they could return to rebuild their temple. Um, then from the Medo Persians, Alexander the Great came in and he took over um, around th uh, he started his conquest around 334 BC and he took over the Medo Persian Empire and that started the Greek Kingdom. 
And then from the Greeks, we have the Romans, which because Alexander, his empire, he died very young, and his empire was divided into four parts. And then the Romans rose up out of one of those parts, and they became the fourth world kingdom. And again, this all goes back to Babylon. Um, the Romans ended up ruling the world. And of course, the Romans are the, the ones that we descend down into modern civilization today because it is Western civilization that ended up controlling the whole planet, if you will. Um, Roman civilization, Western civilization, uh, led in all the way up t into the age of imperialism. And uh, the age of imperialism is when the rest of the entire planet was conquered, beginning with uh, the, the conquering of the, the conquistadors of the known world all the way up until, uh, you know, the times of the Box Rebellion in China and things that, you know, uh, things like that, that the conquest of Africa and the imper age of imperialism and India and so forth, and the East India Company. Um, all, all those, all those uh, conquering of the planet by Western civilization um, all goes back to the Roman Empire, which goes back to the Greek Empire, which goes back to the Medo-Persian Empire, which goes back to Babylon, which goes back to Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. So that is the world civilization. Aside from that, we have another kingdom, which is the kingdom that God set apart via the nation of Israel all the way until the Messiah of Christ. Now, the nation of Israel disappeared for, for quite some time because uh, they were they were sent into captivity in Babylon. And then, of course, after uh, the Bar Kokhba revolt and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and the Bar Kokhba in 135, um, they were sent into diaspora. And the nation of Israel was in bondage and slavery throughout the nations of the earth so that it didn't exist for almost two millennia, again, until 1948, which, again, shows that Christ is soon to return for his bride because Christ was the Messiah that uh, received the kingdom, the, the keys of the kingdom of Israel, and uh, he sits on David's throne and will return again to rule on, on, on earth at, at his second coming. Um, but he, the, the, the book of Daniel says that the um, saints will take the kingdom um, after talking about these four empires and that they will set up an everlasting kingdom that will never end. Christ will be the head of that kingdom. He is the, the chosen Messiah and the Son of God. Um, all of this is talked about in the book of Daniel. And uh, again, the book of Daniel goes back to before uh, the time of uh, uh, 70 AD and the time of Christ even, because we have those, um, those texts that were found um, in uh, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which again were found in 1947, but date back to before the time of Christ, even all the way possibly to, to shortly before the time of the Romans. So what I want to do now is kind of get into some of those prophecies and show how that they tie in with Bible chronology. But again, uh, th this is the part that will prove that traditional Bible chronology um, cannot possibly be accurate based on the, the, the misgivings or misunderstandings of historical events um, that our modern academia has right now as far as those particular periods of the Babylonians and the Achaemenids or Medo-Persians. Um, the, the main main point I want to make with the Babylonian Empire, where, where they run into error, um, is that they have the 37th year of uh, Nebuchadnezzar tied to an astronomical tablet, um, a cuneiform tablet that was found in uh, the Middle East. And um, th this tablet states that it, it exists in the 37th year, and it, it has various uh, uh, astronomical recordings on, to, on it, which only happen, you know, once every like 40,000 years or something like that. Um, that show that it, uh, the 37th year has to be in 568 B.C. Now, I've actually gone through astronomical software and looked at the translation of this tablet and confirmed that, yes, that, that these uh, particular um, recordings do most likely refer to 568 B.C. Um, and the reason for that is because it's, it's actually kind of easy to, to determine um, from astronomical recordings when a certain date happened in history uh, because the, um, the planets, as they move around the zodiac, um, only occur at certain uh, intervals. Like, for example, Jupiter will go around the zodiac. Uh, it'll appear in one sign of the zodiac um, uh, every year for a period of 12 years. So every 12 years, Jupiter comes back to where it was in the zodiac. Uh, Saturn, roughly every 30 years or so. Uh, Mars, every 24 months, give or take. The sun will go through uh, one sign of the zodiac every month. And then uh, the moon, obviously, will have 12 uh, revolutions uh, in the course of a year. Um, the, the, the other two visible planets that would have been able to be seen in ancient times, which have been Mercury and Venus, they dance around the sun because they orbit the sun. So as the sun goes through the zodiac, they're always bouncing back and forth following the sun. Uh, but that's how you can tell 
um, certain points in history because if Jupiter is in a certain point, it's only there once every 12 years, and Saturn's in a certain point, it's only there once every 30 years, and Mars is in a certain point, it's only there once every 24 months or so, um, then uh, or 28 months or whatever it is, um, the it's a, you can very easily just from those three planets come up with a date that only happens very seldom in history. And so based on that, plus all the other listings in the astronomical tablet um, from the 37th year of, of the date of Nebuchadnezzar, um, as, as it's written, um, we can probably pretty much conclude that it is 568 B.C. Uh, and again, I went through an astronomy program to confirm this, but yeah, it does, it does appear to be from that date. So how then, you would ask, how do I come up with this date of Nebuchadnezzar from being much later than 538 B.C.? Well, the reason I come up with that is because that particular cat tablet, which I believe hinges all the other um, astronomical dates for the Babylonian period, um, that particular tablet, uh, I don't believe actually dates to the 37th year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Rather, I believe it dates to the 37th year of the reign of Ashurbanipal, who was an Assyrian king. And the reason I say that is because that tablet was shown to um, be a copy of an earlier recording. It was... It was dated later in history showing that whatever scribe wrote that down made that as a copy of an earlier tablet. And so what I believe probably happened was they made an error and wrote down because of the uh, reign of Ashurbanipal, um, his reign would have covered more than 40 years and there are too many kings from the Babylonian period that would cover a, a reign of more than 40 years, but Nebuchadnezzar certainly was one of them, but Ashurbanipal would have been the other one. Um, he probably assumed the wrong king when he was recording that, and he put down the, the 37th year of, of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, that's my conjecture and suggestion that that's an error, um, but I, once we do do that, and we take a look at Ashurbanipal and put him in as, as the 37th year being 568, now all the other dates uh, along those lines fall into place perfectly, and the reign of Nebuchadnezzar falls into the Bible chronology uh, dates that I have um, listed below. With one caveat... And that is that um, the uh, first year of Nebuchadnezzar, as listed in the book of Daniel, I don't believe is his first year in terms of overall reign, um, because what had happened was, again, getting back into how these kings were vying for, for, for supremacy against each other all the time, and, and who would pay tribute to who, there was a battle called Carchemish, where um, Nebuchadnezzar basically defeated the Egyptians and the, uh, the Medes and so forth, and became... Uh, the chief king of the empire of the world of that time. And so I believe that the dating of the book of Daniel either refers to the, the first year starting when he became the supreme uh, emperor, as you will, if you will, as opposed to just a king of a, a specific area, um, or it is, it's referring to the first year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar as it pertains to Daniel, which may have been 20 or 30 years in his, into, uh, or 20 years or so into Nebuchadnezzar's reign, but was the first year of the reign um, for Daniel and the Israelites uh, that, that were taken captive with him. So if that's uh, an interpret correct interpretation, again, that would also confirm um, the, uh, the fact that Nabonidus and Cyrus are contemporaries and so forth. Um, all the other dates begin to fall into place very quickly, and I can go over to that in uh, more detail in another video. Um, but that's, that's one particular sticking point that I need to get into. But once you do that, it becomes very clear that uh, the time frame from the um, that the end of the captivity and the time frame from the start of the captivity and under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar um, cannot be and the time frame rather the construction of the, the second temple cannot be a couple hundred years as modern chronology would have it um, but rather it has to be the 70 years outlined in the Bible from from Nebuchadnezzar until the second year of the reign of uh, Darius the second is a 70 year period and that is the period of the captivity and that is far cry different from uh, what the, the, the way that people try to piece it together now um, that just does not jive with what Scripture says because Scripture is pretty clear that this is a 70-year period. And they come up with all different times of, of ways to, to come up with this, stating, um, for example, that uh, you know, there are these, these different decrees that uh, you know, when do we start the counting of Daniel's 70, or, uh, 70 weeks? Does it start the decree of Artaxerxes, the decree of Darius? Is it, these are, are simply inconceivable if you just take Scripture at, at uh, face value that it is what it says it is, um, that there are 70 years of captivity. Um, once you piece it together and believe Scripture, all the other pieces come into place. Um, scripture reveals, reveals the truth of history rather than the other way around. If we rely on Scripture as the bedrock and foundation for the understanding of our world history, then we'll be able to discover 
how the rest of those world historical pieces come together um, by following scripture. So I'm going to give a couple examples now of why, again, the modern uh, chronology has to be wrong. Um, first of all, to give you the dates of that, this is this is where the modern chronology gets into an error. They have the the reign of of Cyrus, who, uh, um, oh, excuse me, 539 BC. They have the reign of Cyrus, who supposedly frees the uh, the captives as uh, starting around 539 BC, and this is supposedly the end of the captivity. Um, or thereabouts, possibly 530 BC, somewhere in there. So, depending on who you talk to or, or who argues the subject, um, you would have the captivity starting around anywhere from 609 BC or less, all the way down to 539 BC, 530 BC, somewhere in there. Um, that that's their rough 70-year period of the captivity, and this being the time period of Nebuchadnezzar uh, on the the top end of that. And then uh, Cyrus being the, the ones who freed him under the Achaemenids or the Medo-Persians around the, the bottom part of that, 539 B.C. And then from there, um, they come up with uh, a, this great gap of time um, all the way in the reigns of Artaxerxes and so forth um, that uh, during the time that they waited until the temple could be constructed and then uh, finally you have the, the start of the construction of the temple which they believe would be under the reign of Darius I, which again I believe is to be an error. It's actually Darius II. Um, all the way until uh, the temple is finally completed, and that uh, from there we have the start of the 490-year prophecy found in Daniel chapter 9. And it might be helpful if I, if I read that prophecy. Um, and again, I, for those of you who, who aren't that versed in the Bible, I hope you forgive me if I'm going over a lot of people's head, or, or but I'm, I'm, I want to speak also to the, to the people who are kind of familiar with some of this stuff so that they can understand where I'm coming from as well. But in, in Daniel chapter 9, um, Again, Daniel was taken captive, um, and he, he wrote the book of Daniel. Um, he covers most of the period of the Babylonian captivity when the Israelites were taken captive, but he was one of the first captives that was taken. Um, he was taken uh, in the, around the first year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, um, who was a Babylonian king, and who, who became king of kings, in my opinion, for a time at the Battle of Carchemish before that uh, title was assumed by Cyrus and, and Darius and so forth. Um, king of kings, obviously, is the supreme emperor who's ruling and, and collecting tribute from all the other little kings. So um, just because uh, someone is listed as a reign, as a king, doesn't mean that, that uh, there aren't other kings ruling or reigning at the same time um, that they could be paying tribute to. And that's important to keep in mind when, when looking at calculations of chronology and tablets and so forth, um, thinking that one king has to exactly follow another. That's not always the case. Many kings often co-reigned, uh, and there were usurpers and other, or other circumstances, but that's another subject. Um, so anyways, Darius, or excuse me, Daniel um, uh, was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar around the first year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. And then uh, what had happened was um, roughly eight uh, years later, Nebuchadnezzar came back to Israel and he uh, took captive another king by the name of Jehoiachin or, or Jeconiah, depending on um, the pronunciation. Um, that king uh, is in the uh, lineage of Christ and the, and the, the line of David in the, in the Messianic prophecies. Um, after that occurred, that he took him bondage, Nebuchadnezzar took uh, Jeconiah bondage, there was another king that was set up in Israel for about 11 years. And then uh, Nebuchadnezzar returned again a third time, and this time Nebuchadnezzar burned the temple down and destroyed the nation of Israel, and he took the rest of the captives. So now we have three uh, uh, periods where Nebuchadnezzar comes and takes captives away. And the third time he came, he burned down the temple and he uh, destroyed Jerusalem and he took away the majority of the captives. There was actually a fourth time in the 23rd year then after that of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. And this is the 23rd year from the reckoning of Daniel and possibly the Battle of Carchemish, not the total time of, of his, his king kingship if, you know, according to my reckoning of chronology. But this would have been toward the very, towards the very end of his reign. Uh, in the 23rd year of uh, of of Nebuchadnezzar, um, a general comes along by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, and he takes another amount of captives, and that's the last captives that are taken out of Israel. And it's from that point that I, I start my interpretation of the reckoning of the um, the uh, captivity of Babylon, and that would have been about 20, uh, uh, 424, uh, excuse me, 494 BC, that that fourth um, and last uh, captivity was taken out of the land of Israel under uh, Nebuchadnezzar's general, Nebuchadnezzar. 
So um, that starts the captivity around 494 BC. Um, so we have Nebuchadnezzar going all the way till around 494 BC under the chronology that I'm showing here. That only works if uh, the 37th year of that particular tablet that I was referring to um, is the 37th year of Ashurbanipal, which was an Assyrian king, uh, as opposed to the 37th year of Nebuchadnezzar. If that's true, it pushes the whole Babylonian and whole Achaemenid uh, empire forward quite a bit. Now, from that time, um, we have uh, shortly after the Nebuzaradan uh, in my chronology is when I have the uh, the, Ac the uh, Medo-Persians taking over. And the Medo-Persians, um, then Cyrus comes along, uh, and he uh, uh, takes over from uh, another king who is a son of uh, Nebuchadnezzar by the name of uh, Nabonidus. And uh, there's also another son there by the name of Belshazzar, and there's some question as to whether Belshazzar is the son of Nebuchadnezzar or his grandson under uh, Nabonidus. But it, um, this is a circumstance, again, where uh, when we talk about kings paying tribute and bowing down to other kings and so forth, it's the uh, Persians under the Achaemenids and the Medo-Persians and Cyrus that end up becoming the emperors and the rulers of the world, um, overthrowing the Babylonians. And so the Babylonians, he may have allowed to rule, again, being king of kings, he may have allowed them, some of them, uh, in the case of Nabonidus and uh, other kings like uh, Amal Marduk, um, he may have allowed them to be king in Babylon for a time, but they weren't the king anymore. They were not the emperor. The emperor now fell to the, the Middle Persians. Uh, particularly, this probably happened at the end of the reign of Nabonidus, which was closer towards the, the midway point, almost, or at least the one-third into the Babylonian captivity, um, that the Middle Persians finally over, completely overthrew um, the uh, Kingdom of Babylon and, and the Neo-Babylonian Empire and uh, basically took total control themselves and uh, ruled from that point on. So from this point you have uh, a, a number of years that go on before um, all the way until the reign of Artaxerxes the first um, continuing down to the end of his reign before the end of the captivity finally happens around 424 BC. And so what happens, um, and it might be helpful if I show you um, kind of the uh, these kings here of the Achaemenid Empire. So just one moment here. Okay, um, you'll have to, uh, most of these dates actually start to become correct in my opinion, but some of them are wrong based on uh, my, my study of uh, the Achaemenid Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire. Um, but it's around... Uh, this, this particular king, Xerxes, here, I question the positioning of when, when he ruled. And, and, and even historians today will debate uh, when the start of his rule uh, um, took place and when the end of his rule took place based on certain historical documents. Um, but I, I question uh, when Xerxes I began to reign. Certainly I question um, when Cambyses and Bardai and, and Darius, possibly th these kings, began to reign. Um, but Nebuchadnezzar and Nab uh, Nabonidus, I believe, uh, carried uh, down their reign um, almost into the reign of uh, Xerxes or, or thereabouts, um, and that they were overruled by the Achaemenid kings during this time. And, and also during this time, Cyrus uh, the Great uh, ruled, and he may have either been a co-ruler um, or possibly Darius the Great may have been uh, um, another name for Cyrus at that point in time, or Darius may have been Cyrax, uh, Cyaxares, uh, which was an uncle of Cyrus. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, his argument, um, even debate in the, in the secular world about the, the particular dates and reigns of these kings. So um, the, the closer we get into history, the better we have uh, an ascertaining the, uh, an understanding of the historical record. Um, but uh, the, the last king here um, before the end of the captivity is Artaxerxes, and he goes all the way till the year 424. Now, the most people who study this today, even in Judeo-Christian beliefs, as well as secular, would suggest that um, the captivity ended around the time of Darius the first, and uh, uh, or earlier, and um, that it was a decree that happened later, either under this Xerxes, Xerxes the first, or this Artaxerxes, um, under which time the temple was built. Now, the problem with that is that 
really doesn't fit with a particular prophecy given in Daniel chapter 9, which I believe has to, and I'll show you why in a second, has to take place um, at the uh, reign of Darius II down here around 423. So, um, again, I think the modern interpretation of that right now is wrong, that, that, that uh, the captivity has to end around here. But Artaxerxes I um, reigned for quite a bit of time. And uh, he would have been one of the one of the first, possibly other than uh, Xerxes and maybe the tail end of Darius or or Cyrus, um, that would have reigned in uh, Babylon um, with no Babylonian neo Babylonian kings anymore in power, um, such as uh, Nebuchadnezzar and, and Belshazzar and so forth, uh, under one possible reckoning. But the point is that the neo Babylonian kingdom ended around this time, and the Medo Persians took over. And Daniel even alludes to the fact, and, and other books like Esther alludes to the fact that the captive, the captives were in captivity for a portion of time under the Achaemenids or the Medo-Persians. Uh, certainly in the, in the case of Esther they were. Uh, and, and in, in the case of Daniel too, it talks about him serving under the, the reigns of Darius and under the reigns of Cyrus. And also um, uh, it talks about uh, Belshazzar, um, his kingdom, who, he's, uh, Belshazzar being a Babylonian, his kingdom being taken over. Uh, by Darius, and that uh, his kingdom being divided between the the Medes and the Persians, and uh, Daniel was appointed to to during that time to serve under King Darius. Uh, so, again, the the uh, there there seems to be in Scripture uh, a, a showing that a portion of the captivity happens under the Medo Persians in addition to the Babylonians. Of course, they're serving Babylon, and the Persians are ruling now over Babylon, so they're still serving the same nation of Babylon. That they're in captive to, but it's the Persians eventually who will let the uh, um, the captives go and return to build the temple uh, uh, under Cyrus and under Darius II. Now the Cyrus that that they returned uh, from captivity uh, under, I don't believe was actually the Cyrus uh, of Cyrus the Great, although that's a possibility because the Cyrus the Great was in the middle of the captivity um, thereabouts. I believe it was actually Cyrus the son of uh, Darius II who made this proclamation around the year 423 BC, or 424 BC, and that he is the Cyrus that, um, along with Darius, that allowed the captives to go. Because again, uh, it was commonplace for sons to be considered kings, um, along with the, the head of the household, and there were, there were co-reigns and co-regencies. Um, so Darius and Cyrus could have very well reigned at the same time, even though Cyrus eventually did not inherit the throne, uh, Cyrus the Younger would be another another king um, that would inherit it, another family member. Um, but during that particular time, Cyrus could still be considered a king. And there are plenty of examples in the Bible where the sons of kings were also called kings as well. So I believe that that particular um, Cyrus that helped free the captives was actually Cyrus the Younger, who was the son of Darius II. And and now Cyrus, uh, may, the, Cyrus the Great may have made a decree as well, um, but I don't believe that the uh, captives were particularly set free, although there is a, a scenario that I've gone through where it's possible that some of the captives were set free um, during the middle of the, the captivity, but the temple certainly was not completed until the reign of Darius II. And now I'm going to show you, get into scripture and show you how this has to be. We'll go to Daniel chapter 9, um, and we'll look at that, the, the prophecy given here for the 70 weeks in Daniel chapter 9. Um, Daniel is talking in Daniel ch chapter 9. He, it's towards the end of the captivity. And um, he's praying because he's concerned that he realizes that uh, there's 70 years of captivity that are foretold and uh, upon his people. And therefore, he knows that the captivity is drawing to a close and he's repenting and uh, for, for the sins of Israel. Um, and, and I'll take it up in, in verse 1. It says, In the first year of Darius, son of Azurus, uh, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years um, where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet and said he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. First point to, to, to point out here. Uh, Ahasuerus is the uh, Hebraic uh, rendering of the name Xerxes. So it is impossible, if you look at the, the uh, list of kings here, is impossible under what most people would suggest um, that the Darius uh, of the first year of, of, of Daniel chapter 9 
could not possibly be uh, a Darius that precedes Xerxes I, because either you need a completely different Ahasuerus or Xerxes, uh, or you need a completely different Darius. Uh, and that's where they come up with this idea of Darius the Mede. Who's this? They make up a Darius that doesn't exist and say, well, he's not found anywhere in history. And who's this Darius the Mede? And therefore the Bible must be wrong because there's no Darius the Mede that happened under the son of Ahasuerus. Or who's Ahasuerus? Is it Artaxerxes or someone else? They, they, they apply things that don't need to be applied and, and because history does prove the Bible. Darius uh, is in the first, chap the first verse of Daniel chapter 9 is the son of Xerxes. So therefore, it cannot be uh, Darius the Great. It has to be a, a son um, that came after Xerxes the Great. Now, an important point uh, to make here is that when they say son of in, in the Hebraic language, that doesn't necessarily mean the direct son of. It could mean uh, a descendant of or a grandson or someone down the line. Jesus is called the son of David or the son of Adam. Um, that doesn't mean he's the direct son. That's just the way that their language works. So to say that Darius is the son of Ahasuerus doesn't necessarily mean that Xerxes, uh, Ahasuerus, that Xerxes is his direct father. It could be uh, a Darius further down the line. So the, the Dariuses that occur after the Xerxes, this Xerxes the Great, uh, first being the Great, the first Darius that comes along is Darius the Second of Persia. Daniel chapter 9 has to take place in the reign of Darius the Second of Persia. The only other possibility is that Darius, uh, Xerxes the Great did have a son named uh, Xerxes, uh, Darius, and uh, it, he was uh, murdered um, shortly after uh, Xerxes died, and, and Artaxerxes ended up taking the throne. Um, it wasn't Artaxerxes that murdered him, but he ended up taking the throne. Um, so that Darius never really got to reign. So uh, that's one slight possibility, but I, I don't believe that that's a correct rendering of Scripture for other reasons, and I'll go into it one, in a little bit later. Another possibility is Artaxerxes um, had a son, Darius, who died as well during his reign, um, that never assumed the kingship, and they called that Darius B, um, but that's a very highly disputed possibility as well. But in my opinion, the only Darius that could possibly fit is Darius II of Persia, around, uh, which took assumed the throne around 424, 423 B.C., and that that is the end of the captivity. Um, that's the Darius that is being referred to in Daniel chapter 9. And I'll show you the second reason why. Now keep in mind when I read this that the book of Daniel, again, was discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947 to before the destruction of the temple. So the events listed here in Daniel chapter 9, we have texts that date back to before the events that they're prophesied about are going to come to pass, namely the destruction of the temple. The texts are older than the events that they foretell are going to come to pass. So this proves that the Bible uh, is prophetic and is true. So again, Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face uh, unto the Lord God to seek in prayer and supplications of fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, uh, keeping the covenant of mercy to them that love him and uh, to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned, we have committed iniquity, we have done wickedly, we have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto the servant of the prophets which uh, spake thy name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to all the land. O Lord, righteousness belong unto thee, uh, but unto us is confusion of faces as as it is this day. Now, that's a good question. Confusion of faces. Is it because perhaps they were thinking, according to that prophecy in Jeremiah, that they should have been released from captivity by now, and they're wondering why uh, the end of the captivity hasn't come to pass? Um, that's certainly one possibility why they may have been confused. Um, and again, so, but unto us is confusion uh, of faces as uh, at this day, to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to all Israel that are near and that are far off throughout all the countries which thou hast driven them. So they're still in captivity. Because of the trespass, they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. Um, to, uh, to the Lord our God belongeth mercies and forgiveness, uh, though we have rebelled against him. Neither we have obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which have set uh, before us by his servants the prophets. Yea, all of Israel have transgressed the law, 
even uh, by departing, that they may not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, the oath written by the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sin, sinned against him. I, I read that curse, by the way, earlier in the Leviticus, talking about the Sabbaths and what would happen to the nation of Israel if they turned away from God. And that is what happened. Um, and, uh, and, he, and he goes on to say, And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges, and judged us, by bringing upon us this great evil, for under the whole heaven has not been done, uh, as has been done upon Jerusalem, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet we made not our prayer before the Lord God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand Thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord God watched upon the evil that uh, and brought it upon us, for the Lord God is righteous in all His works which He doeth, for we obeyed not His voice. And now, O Lord our God, that has brought Thy people forth. Uh, out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and has gotten gotten the renown as at this day we have uh, sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem. So again, Jerusalem, still uh, the fury and anger is against it at this point. Um, turned away from thy city Jerusalem, uh, thy holy mountain, because of our sins and for our iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem, and thy people are become a reproach uh, to all uh, that are about us. Now, therefore, O God, hear the hear the prayer of, uh, of thy servant and his supplications, because and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate. So again, still during the captivity, the sanctuary is still desolate. Uh, for the for the Lord's sake, O my God, incline thy ear and, and hear upon thine eyes. Behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name for we do not present our for we uh, do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness uh, but for thy great mercies o lord hear o lord forgive o lord hearken uh, and do not defer from uh, for thy thine sake o my god for thy city and for thy people called by thy name uh, and while and so he's he's going on and he's he's uh, making this prayer and supplication now one point i want to make here is that this is this supplication is happening at the end of the 70 years, not the beginning. And the reason I say that is because, uh, again, this is happening in the first year of Darius. Uh, the beginning of this supplication, the Babylonians were ruling, Nebuchadnezzar and so forth. So because this is happening under the reign of the Medo-Persians, we know this is at the end of the, uh, of the uh, Babylonian captivity or somewhere or thereabouts, and not at the beginning. So he's praying about the 70 years and, and the coming of the end of the 70 years. And now it goes on to say that at, at this time, while as I was speaking, this is Daniel talking, uh, and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of the people and presenting the supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, who's an angel, uh, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning. Now the vision he's talking about, he had some visions that he received in the chapters prior um, during the reign of a Babylonian king named Belshazzar, and I'll get into that a little bit later, but just important to note that. Um, and, and he met Gabriel at that time. Uh, yea, while speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, uh, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. The evening oblation is uh, every morning and evening they would uh, have a sacrifice. And this was the time they took astronomical recordings because um, you could see half the zodiac uh, in the star position, the stars and so forth, um, at the time of the rising of the sun, uh, j just as the, 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 uh, it was still dark as it was going light. And then you'd be able to see the other half um, of the zodiac just the time it was setting. So those are the times that they do the astronomical recordings, and at the time they would do their their sacrifices as well. So, at the time of the evening oblation, okay, I, while I was yet speaking in prayer, uh, even the man Gabriel who had seen the vision in the beginning caused it to fly swiftly and touch me at the time of the evening oblation, and he informed me and talked with me and said, "O oh, Daniel, uh, I am now come to give thee skill and understanding at the beginning of the sub of thy supplications." Now, what supplications? The beginning, what supplications? Daniel just was praying for repentance for the sins of Israel. At the beginning of his supplications is, is what Gabriel is referring to. He says, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth. Now, that's an important point because um, many people will try to say, when's this commandment, this decree of the rebuilding of the temple, what, what king was it under and so forth, so we know when to start the counting of Daniel's 70 weeks, which I'm going to discuss in a moment. Um, he says it right in the chapter when it begins. Daniel's talking in the first year of the reign of Darius, which is Darius II, the son of Xerxes. And it says that uh, D Gabriel tells him, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth. So we know we don't have to find a decree for Xerxes or Artaxerxes or anything like that. We know 
when the decree is, the decree is given in the first year of the reign of Darius, when Daniel is speaking. So at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth. And I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, uh, understand the matter and consider the vision. Uh, seventy weeks, and this is the seventy weeks prophecy now, the famous seventy weeks prophecy. Uh, seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, uh, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks the street shall be built and the wall even in troubled times. And after threescore and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Uh, that's the evening and the morning sacrifice. Uh, and, uh, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even to the consummation. And that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. So the 70 weeks prophecy we just shown here. It culminates with the destruction of the temple. It says it right in it. It says... And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the, the, the end thereof shall come with a flood, and unto the end wars and desolations are determined. And he shall confirm a coming with many for one week, and in the midst of the week it shall cause the uh, sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations shall, he shall make it desolate, even to the consummation that are determined shall be poured out into the desolate. So the 70 weeks prophecy ends with the destruction of the temple, and the destruction of the city. Well, we know what year that happens. That happens in 70 A.D. Therefore, the 70 weeks prophecy has to end in 70 A.D. And if it ends in 70 A.D. and it's 70 weeks, which is 490 years, it's not weeks, literal weeks. He's talking about, the again, the sabbatical years I discussed earlier, 77s. That, that's the actual literal uh, uh, rendering of the Hebrew. It's 77s. There are 77s or 70 sabbatical years that, that are determined here. Um, the end of those 70 years has to end in 70 A.D. So all we have to do is go back 490 years from 70 A.D. to find out when is this prophecy being given. Because that is when the sanctuary was destroyed. That is when the city and the temple were destroyed in Jerusalem. So we'll go 70 minus 77, which is 490. And uh, we come to uh, 421 B.C., which is um, the... Uh, 421, you have to add a year because there's no year zero because we're going back to B.C. So 421 B.C. Um, now, it's actually year 69 um, because the, uh, the the temple was cut off in uh, in would have been six, the 69th year, um, February, because that particular year, um, the new year doesn't start till spring in April. So because the siege and so forth start in February, it actually goes back to the 69th year of this particular prophecy. So we, we would count from 69 back. So around 421, 422 B.C. would be the first year of the reign of Darius when this prophecy was given. Well, let's look at our Achaemenid map here. Darius II of Persia begins reigning around 423 to 422. Uh, therefore, his first year is around 422 B.C. That fits right in with the prophecy. Daniel speaking in the first year of Darius. It's 70 weeks, which is 490 years, until the, the destruction of the temple. The temple is destroyed in 70 AD. There shouldn't be any question about this. It clearly, Daniel is speaking in the, the reign of, of Darius II, around 2 BC. But there's another confirmation that proves this as well. If we go on to look here, in Daniel chapter uh, 11, um, in Daniel chapter 10, there's there's uh, more proof that this has to be Darius II. Daniel chapter 10 says that in the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, now I believe this is Cyrus the Younger, which is Darius' son. Uh, in the third year of Cyrus, king of the Persian, a thing was revealed to, Na to Daniel. His name was called Belteshazzar, and that thing was true, and the time was appointed was long, and the understanding of the thing, he, he goes on to talk about this, this vision. And uh, an angel comes to speak to him and begins to talk about this, this uh, vision to reveal things to Daniel. But the angel continues to say, um, in chapter 11, he says, Also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, we just talked about Darius, 
I stood to confirm and strengthen him. Now again, Darius took over after some uh, battles here, if you will, with two other descendants of Artaxerxes before he regained the throne. So there was a little bit of a struggle here, but Darius ended up winning out. It says, I also, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood to confirm and strengthen him, and now I will show the, tr the, the truth. Behold, there shall yet stand up three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all, and by his strength, and through his riches, he shall stir up the, uh, against the realm of Grecia, or the Greeks. And a mighty king shall stand up, and shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And we, when he shall stand up, the kingdom shall be broken, and shall be divided to the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which shall be ruled, for this kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. He's talking about Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great is the Greeks who, who ended up defeating the Persians, and uh, his kingdom was not left as, as heir. It was divided between his four generals, and it was broken up into the, those are the four winds of heaven. Um, that uh, they ended up becoming four different kingdoms, and out of one of them arose the Roman Empire. The Seleucids um, was the name of that kingdom. So anyways, clearly there, the, the angel just said that there are three, yet three kings will stand up in Persia, and a fourth would be greater than them all. He would stir up the Greeks under Alexander the Great, whose kingdom would be divided to four parts. Well, let's look at our chronology here again. We have uh, Darius the second. Okay. Um, there, he's, he's, he's speaking in the, the reign of the third year of Cyrus, which is, uh, I believe, to be Darius's son, um, referring to uh, three more kings that would stand up in Persia and a fourth would be greater than them all. Well, we have, after Darius II, we have the first king, Artaxerxes II, the second king, Artaxerxes III, the third king, Artaxerxes IV, and then the fourth king, which is richer than them all, which stirs up the whole realm of Grecia, or Alexander the Great is Darius the Third, and then of course uh, Alexander the Great comes along and defeats Darius the Third in his kingdom, and uh, his kingdom is divided between the four parts. So again, clear evidence that we're talking about Darius the Second as being the time of this writing of Daniel. Now, one of the reasons why um, a lot of scholars and a lot of theologians would reject this being Darius the Second is because they would say it's impossible for Daniel to be writing at this time because under their chronology, uh, if uh, the time of Nebuchadnezzar and the start of the Babylonian captivity is around the year 600, give or take, uh, or 590 or somewhere in there, if Daniel was taken very early on before the, the regular captivity, he was taken in the, the first group of captives at the beginning of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, which would have been in, in the 600s, um, under their reckoning, then it's impossible for Daniel to still be alive all the way down to the reign of Darius II in the year 423, because from the year 600 BC to 423 is far too long for Daniel to live. This also runs into another problem in the book of Esther, because it says in Esther that Mordecai, uh, when you read the book of Esther, that Mordecai is um, one of the people that was taken captivity uh, captive, um, but yet Mordecai uh, is existing during the reign of, of Ahasuerus or Xerxes, which would have been long after their reckoning uh, uh, of time frame of the, the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, and therefore it's impossible for uh, uh, Medi uh, Mordecai to have been taken into captivity and yet still exist in the time of, of Nebuchadnezzar, he would have been, he, or uh, of Xerxes, he would have been too old. Not a problem under this reckoning, because again, the time from Nebuchadnezzar to Darius II is a very short time frame, and Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, falls right in the middle of it, very easy for uh, uh, Mordecai to have been taken captive during the captivity um, under uh, Nebuchadnezzar and still uh, exist under the reign of Xerxes. Plus the fact that we show that all the people are still captives under the Medo-Persians um, during this time frame, so therefore the captivity is still going on. Um, all these will continue to show that this is a 70-year captivity between Nebuchadnezzar and Darius II, not 200 and some years or, or whatever um, you know, crazy chronology that, that we, unfortunately we have right now because of our misunderstandings. Um, so again, uh, the Bible clearly shows that uh, 70 years took place and that Daniel was around at the time of the end of the captivity. Now I want to go back to that 70-week prophecy because it's important also. Um, many people will already be saying, well, wait a minute, this refers to Christ. I agree, it does refer to Christ. Um, but we need to be careful here and to question whether or not it's referring to the crucifixion of Christ um, or whether it's referring to the overall time period. Because again, if, if we look at the, uh, 
the date of the coming of the Messiah in this. And this is going to be a little bit difficult here, but I'll go into this. Um, Seventy weeks are determined upon the people, I'm reading, reading from, starting from verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon the people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make a reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision of the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Let's break that 70 down into uh, uh, the following subdivisions here that they're, they're about to in the, in the coming verses. We have 62 years that the temple, or that the city is built, and the walls, and so forth. Um, we have another period of 49 years until the coming of the Messiah. And then we have a seven-year period, um, which is a, a confirmation of a covenant. And in the midst of the seven-year period, a, uh, the, the sacrifice is taken away, the evening and the morning sacrifice. Um, that makes up the total of the 70 weeks. So it's starting in verse 25. It says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. And threescore and two weeks shall the, the street be built again and the wall even, trouble, even in troublous times. Now, a lot of people will say that this is referring to the crucifixion of Christ and that um, it, uh, that the seven-week time period um, at which, uh, in the middle, in which Messiah is cut off, uh, it says that after, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off and not for himself. And uh, later on it says, in the covenant shall be confirmed for one week, in the midst of the week it shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to, to cease. They interpret that to be the crucifixion of Christ. Um, I would somewhat disagree that, that that's not what that's saying. It is referring to, to Christ, but I don't believe that's the specific events that there it's referring to. Um, and the the reason becomes quite clear if we read the, the scripture to mean what it says it means. Um, first of all, uh, if the Messiah comes, know therefore and understand that the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. Okay, There's 49 years there. If Messiah comes at the end of 49 years, okay, from the time of this writing, which is in uh, 490... 1 BC about, um, that's certainly far, far before the coming of Christ. So um, the only other possibility uh, is that it's 47 sevens plus 62 sevens before the coming of Christ. But then the question begs, why not just say 69 sevens? Why say seven sevens and 62? There's no really reason given uh, under, under the modern reckoning, if it's to apply to the crucifixion, as to why you have this subdivision between 49 and, and uh, 62, except to say that during those 62 years, the, the city would be built and so forth, and they're, so they're adding a slight subdivision in there. Um, but the problem is that it, that's kind of not really what the scripture is saying. It's saying that, um, know therefore and understand that from going forth the commandment to, the, to restore Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. And then it says, and three score and two weeks shall the street be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. It would more seem to appear that the Messiah is coming at the end of the seven weeks, um, and that the, after three score and two week, that you have a three score and two week period of 434 years that the, the city is rebuilt, and that after that time, um, Messiah would be cut off. So here's a question How does the Messiah live 434 years? If, if Messiah comes at the end of the seven weeks, 449 years, and then the streets and the cities are built for 434 years, and then the Messiah is cut off, is this talking about one Messiah, the Messiah, Christ, one person? Or is this referring to the officeship of Messiah in the same way that we would say Caesar when we're referring to a whole bunch of different people that filled that office? We would say Caesar, the kingship of Caesar would come or something like that. Um, the, the, the anointed prince, uh, Messiah coming, is referring to the, the returning of the captivity and the, the anointed line of uh, of uh, um, that, that comes under uh, Zerubbabel and under Nehemiah and so forth uh, to bring about the, the kingship, uh, of the restoration after Babylon of the kingship that was taken out of Israel, the, the Davidic line, if you will. And that Davidic line carries on throughout the entire 434 years, including Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate Messiah, the Messiah, um, but finally is not cut off. That, that line, again, is not cut off again, until the destruction of the city again, which comes in 70 AD, um, and particularly uh, in 62 AD, and I'll explain why in a second here, or 63 AD, about there. Um, so from 491 BC, we have 49 weeks uh, uh, for the coming of the sign. Oh, therefore, and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. By the way, who, who had the command to restore and build Jerusalem? Zerubbabel did. Zerubbabel led uh, the captives out of, out of captivity, and he's the one who went and rebuilt the temple. So this is the start of the restoration of the Davidic line, 
which was lost under, well, it wasn't lost, Jeho Jehoiachin or Jeconiah was taken to captivity, the, the Messiah, the Messianic line, the anointed line, was taken out of Israel, it would be restored again under Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is the signet ring, if you will, the start of the, the Messianic line. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, Zerubbabel, shall be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. Now, the seven sevens is the time period up until the start of the construction of the city of Jerusalem. And then it says sixty-two sevens, the streets and the walls will be built even in troublous times. What this is referring to is the coming of Nehemiah uh, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes. Now, this is uh, the 20th year of Artaxerxes uh, Nenam, Menmam, excuse me, which is a reign from 404 to 359 BC. So in his 20th year, Nehemiah comes along um, to uh, start building the walls and uh, build, uh, which which they were prohibited from doing. They could only build the temple under Darius uh, and Zerubbabel, but they built the walls in the city again under Nehemiah in very troublous times. If you read the book of Nehemiah, you understand that they had to hold their weapons while they're building the walls because that's how dangerous it was. It took them about 12 years under Nehemiah to finally construct this in a matter of weeks to finally finish the gates and so forth. Um, but then uh, around uh, year 32 of the reign of Artaxerxes, um, which is 49 years after the start of this prophecy, is when uh, that the city was finally completed. And so that is the start of the 62 weeks of the uh, fulfillment of the, the, the walls of the uh, the time period of the city of Jerusalem we built, as opposed to the restoration of the temple of Jerusalem, which happened earlier, 49 years earlier, under Zerubbabel. So let's read this again. After three score and uh, so know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, the walls shall be built and the, the, the uh, streets even in troublous times. And after three score and two, uh, two weeks, that's that's 434 years, okay? If the Messiah is coming and then after 434 years the Messiah is cut off, it's talking about the messianic line, not just, of which Jesus Christ is the ultimate Messiah, but, but the restoration of the Davidic line, not just uh, one particular person in, in individual. Uh, after three score and two weeks shall uh, Messiah be cut off, the messianic line will be cut off. Now, the three score and two weeks of 434 years, what year does that take us to? That takes us up to about the year 63 BC, which is the, the start of the 70th week of Daniel. So uh, the problem is that you would say, okay, well, Jesus was crucified in uh, year 33, 34, or thereabouts. Um, how can it be that the Messianic line is cut off in year 62? Uh, well, again, we're talking about the whole time frame here. Well, first of all, the, the messianic line was not cut off with Jesus. Jesus rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven. He sat on the right hand of the throne in heaven and is still there today. So Jesus is taken out of Israel. Um, so the messianic line is taken out of Israel in the sense that he, he departed for a time period until a second coming. Um, but he is still the Messiah. He's, a, he's a, in a sense, a, a, in the same way that Jeconiah was taken out of the land, you still had a messianic line, but it wasn't uh, ruling in Israel. Jesus is ruling from his throne in heaven, but he's not ruling on earth yet. He will rule on earth when he comes at his second coming. But the, again, why is it that uh, if he ascended to heaven um, around 33, 34 AD, then why is it that uh, the messianic line and this prophecy is cut off around the year 62 if we add up the dates? Well, uh, there's one other point I want to make here. Um, the, if, again, if the messianic line is talking about the, the family line, of Jesus, including Zerubbabel, all the way down to Jesus. Um, when Jesus was crucified, again, going back to this idea of the kings and the firstborn and the secondborn and so forth, um, who would be the next in line uh, of the messianic line, even though he didn't receive the throne, but who would be the next in the messianic line uh, during that time? Well, Jesus' bro uh, uh, brother, uh, the Lord, uh, the brother of the Lord, is James the Just, according to the Bible. And James was uh, killed around 62 or 63 uh, A.D., and he is the last of the Davidic line before the destruction of Jerusalem and the Diaspora. At that point in time, that, that's the end of the Davidic line, which uh, uh, reigned, which uh, didn't reign, but uh, rather occurred in Jerusalem, all the way from Zerubbabel all the way down to James the Just, and of which Jesus is the ultimate Messiah. Now, that's not to say that Jesus gave the throne to James, but it certainly 
um, James was was in authority uh, in the in in the church on earth at the time that uh, uh, because many of the elders referred to James he was he was in Jerusalem as being a pillar of the church and so forth um, that uh, James was considered a leader of the church um, while Jesus departed to assume, to assume the throne in heaven so if James is of the messianic line now James is not the Messiah Jesus is the Messiah um, James is on the messianic line. Um, James was killed, but he was thrown from the top of the temple and then stoned around the year 62, 63 uh, uh, AD. This is the end of the messianic Davidic line, starting with Zerubbabel, that, that existed in Israel during that time. And at that point in time, now we have a seven-year period countdown to the destruction of the sanctuary. Sanctuary. So let's go back and read those scriptures again. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. The messianic line shall be cut off. That occurred with James. Um, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and to the end the wars uh, wars and desolations are determined. The people of the prince that shall come, uh, the Herodians, Caesar, um, uh, Titus, and, and Vespasian, and so forth, um, will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, and then in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to, to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even to the consummation that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. Confirming the covenant with many for one week. Well, there's, there's something else that coincided from the time of Zerubbabel and the start of the second temple to the time of James, and that is the destruction of Zerubbabel's, or the completion of Herod's temple. See, what had happened was... Um, Zerubbabel built a temple, and the kings of, of uh, Persian media said that they had to, particularly under Darius, said they had to uh, build the temple a certain way. And they said that um, anybody who violated the, this building of the temple, of Zerubbabel's temple, um, that they, uh, their house would be torn down and they would be hung upon a cross, um, etc., etc., um, so that they, they could not violate this. Now, Jesus took that, that punishment, in my opinion, uh, upon um uh, upon himself, on, uh, in order that the law might be fulfilled, he, he put or took our sins and our iniquities, um, so that the uh, God might dwell with us instead of of a building made of stone, i.e., the temple. Um, so, uh, but he fulfilled the law; he accepted that, and he took upon him, even though he was sinless, he, he took upon our iniquities, and he also t uh, took a, uh, fulfilled that proclamation about uh, you know being torn, uh, his house being torn down, and being uh, crucified upon the timbers of his house. And so forth. That the, the temple that was created in Jerusalem under Zerubbabel, Herod later came along um, shortly before the time of Jesus was born, and decided that he wants to build a greater temple, which was against the proclamation given under the the kings of Medo Persia um, that they could only build a temple to these certain size and dimensions and so forth. So Herod wanted to build this really great, awesome temple, and the priests at the time didn't want to let him do it because. They said, uh, you know, we need to continue the sacrifices and the offerings, and uh, if you build the temple, it's going to disrupt that. So what Herod agreed to do is he said that he would build the temple around Zerubbabel's temple and continue to construct it, and he would not tear down the inner chamber of Zerubbabel's temple until the outer temple was completed. And this construction on Herod's temple started around a, a decade or two before um, the birth of Christ, and it lasted all the way up until 63 uh, B.C., when it was finally completed. And so, at some point, uh, Zerubbabel's temple was torn down, um, and, and Herod's temple was built around it, almost like a siege, almost emblematic of, of Jerusalem being uh, under siege, and then eventually destroyed. So, in a sense, the third temple, you could say, would be Herod's temple, because Herod is the temple that, that took over for Zerubbabel's temple. Now, Zerubbabel's temple was, uh, if Herod's temple was completed in 63 B.C., that was the end of Zerubbabel's temple. So we have Zerubbabel's temple starting in around 421 B.C., going to about 63 B.C., but we also have the Davidic line going from 421 B.C., ending with about James the Just around 63 B.C., coinciding with the time of the temple, uh, showing the time of the, the, the Messianic uh, Davidic line uh, occurring in Israel. And then it says that the uh, after three score and two weeks, uh, which is around 63 B.C., 434 years after uh, Nehemiah, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the princes shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end shall, thereof shall be with a flood, and the end, to the end wars and desolations are determined. Shortly after that, uh, you had the Jewish revolt start around uh, midway through 
um, that period between 63 and 70. And it says, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. One of the reasons for the, the Jewish revolt starting up um, was that, uh, or one of the causes of the Jewish revolt, uh, or the Romans to respond to it, was that um, the, uh, the Jews of that day decided to stop offering sacrifices uh, midway through around 66 uh, AD for Caesar, um, as they had done in the morning and the evening. And uh, so that's midway through the seven-year period. Again, the, the confirmation of the covenant, one interpretation of the confirmation of the covenant is the confirmation of the completion of Herod's temple. And he said he would build the temple around Zerubbabel's temple and wouldn't tear it down until the other one was completed. This, this was completed around 63 BC. Another confirmation could be the confirmation of this particular prophecy in Daniel. Um, but again, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Um, and you can read about uh, that ceasing I was talking about in, uh, in uh, Josephus' writing. Um, and he shall make it desolate, even to the consummation uh, determined, and uh, that shall be poured out upon the desolate. The sanctuary and the city was made desolate, uh, even to the end, in 70 AD, and that was the finality. So we can see that the, the prophecy of, of the 70 weeks in Daniel um, fits together perfectly with, histor with the historical record. But the most important thing to note about this is this, uh, this was written before this all occurred. And we know it was written before it all occurred because the, the book of Daniel um, exists uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, were, which were uncovered in 1947, um, were uh, uh, date back to before the destruction of the Temple of 70 AD and uh, before the, the time of Christ, even up to possibly 60 AD or, or thereabouts, even before, slightly before the Romans took over Judea. So an amazing prophecy that perfectly fits uh, the, uh, the time period of the destruction of the Temple and shows and proves the Bible is prophetic and true. So um, that's... Uh, that's kind of a look at chronology and a look at uh, the end times. There, there are a couple other prophecies that I kind of want to get into here real quick in, in the book of, of Daniel. Um, in chapter 7, there's a prophecy that... Oh, actually, I'm going to back, backtrack a little bit here. Um, there's a prophecy of 13, 1290 days and 1335 days um, that talks about the, uh, the daily sacrifice being taken away and blessed are those who come to the end of the 1335 days. Uh, I, for the sake of brevity now, because I'm, I'm going quite a bit long on this video, um, one thing I want to point out is that if we go from the time that the uh, the the temple was uh, taken over by the Romans in 70 AD, and the sacrifice ended and the, the abomination of desolation set up, which um, I believe was a Roman eagle that they put in the temple to worship, but also um, embankments, that they, Roman eagles that they put around, and siege cannon, uh, uh, mechanic uh, machines and so forth to overcome the walls so that they could breach the city. Um, that particular time uh, uh, period, if we count from where that's recorded in history, 1335 days, that brings us to the end of the siege of Masada, which is, is kind of the end of the whole Jewish revolt for that time period, which is rather ironic because that's portrayed at the, uh, in the book of Daniel. Um, but it does it to the day, uh, which is kind of interesting. And then the 1290 days, um, that could be the time period leading up to the, uh, from the time that the sacrifice for Caesar was being stopped up until the um, uh, the Romans took over the temple in 70, or possibly could be referring to uh, 1290 days uh, for the, the, the building of the, the siege works or the, the ramp leading up to Masada um, before the final 45 days um, to the destruction when the people at Masada ended up actually killing themselves except for a small remnant, and those that were left were the last survivors of this whole Jewish revolt that happened in this area. That's one area I wanted to talk about. But the other prophecy in, in the book of Daniel that I want to talk about too that is an amazing prophecy that pertains to our time period. Um, in, uh, uh, we'll start in Daniel chapter 7. It says, In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, I had a dream and vision upon my head, uh, uh, upon this bed. Um, excuse me. <laughs> Daniel had a dream and, and visions of his head upon his bed. Uh, then he wrote his dream and told us some of the manners. And Daniel uh, saw four great beasts that came out of the sea, diverse one another. First is like a lion and had eagle's wings. This is the Babylonian kingdom. Uh, the second, uh, he, he beheld that the wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand up. And the feet of a man was given to it, a man of a heart, uh, and a man's heart was given to it. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar um, earlier talks about how he went crazy for four years until he, uh, he, he became like a beast, and then he was um, lifted up the earth and became uh, sane again, if you will. 
and a, uh, so that could be one allegation uh, allusion to that. And then I said, behold, another beast, a second beast, like unto a bear, uh, raised up in itself, and it had three ribs in its mouth and its teeth uh, of it, and said it would thus arise and devour much flesh. Um, the one, the bear that's raised up with one side larger than the other, that's the Medo Persians, the combination of the Medes and the Persians, one being larger than the other. Um, the three ribs in, in its mouth could be the Babylonians, the Assyrians, uh, possibly the Egyptians, um, that it, it took over the, those kingdoms. Uh, and after this, I beheld and lo, another leopard, like a leopard, which came back, and it, uh, like a leopard, which had upon its back uh, four wings and a fowl and a beast, and also four heads, and had great dominion given to it. This is Alexander the Great, um, and he comes along, and his kingdom is divided between his four generals after he passes. Uh, and after this uh, a night, I saw the visions of, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had uh, great iron teeth, and it devoured and break into pieces, and it stamped the residue, the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the other beasts, uh, that were before it, and it had ten horns. And it considered the horns, and beheld it came up among them a little horn, uh, before whom there were the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, uh, uh, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and the mouth speaking great things. Um, this this is the Roman kingdom. Now there's one possibility that the ten horns are actually the ten cities of the Decapolis, uh, which were uh, uh, Greco-Roman cities that were placed, uh, planted in Israel to Hellenize or um, do away or introduce Greco-Roman culture and delude uh, the Israelite culture at the time. So it's possible that those particular cities are the, the four, uh, four the, the ten horns or the uh, ten toes, if you will. That's one possibility. Um, but clearly, this is referring to the Romans. And he says, I consider the horns, and, and behold, there came up among them a little horn. Uh, this is the Antichrist. Um, and before whom were uh, three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. Now there's one possibility that that's referring to the, uh, um, you know, something going on with the Decapolis, or possibly could be referring to the earlier kingdoms of uh, Medo-Persia and uh, uh, the Greeks and uh, Babylon, and that the uh, fourth horn is Caesar. Um, you know, there, there's different ways to look at that. And I beheld that the horns were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit. And the other thing too is this could be still be a future prophecy. We could still be under this fourth beast according to this prophecy. Um, so these ten horns and ten kings might be something that's coming very shortly in our time, particularly um, if uh, the tribulation is about to happen in the next uh, uh, decade or so. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came a, a among them another little horn, before whom were plucked up three of the first horns, plucked up the roots, and behold, uh, this horn were given to eyes like a man, and the mouth speaking great things. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, and the garment was white as snow, and the hair, his hair was uh, white like pure wool, and the throne was like fiery flame, and the wheels is burning fire. Now, um, the uh, so here we have the return of Christ, um, or uh, could be you know it could be allegory to Christ the first time, um, and his kingdom, the work he did on the cross, and eventually how the Christians took over the uh, kingdom of Rome, and uh, the pagan Rome became Christian. Um, but I believe it's more possibly referring to the the final return of Christ and he's setting up the throne in the final judgment, which again would happen very shortly, probably in the next decade or two, based on this chronology. Uh, and a fiery stream issued and came forth out of him, and thousands of thousands ministered him, and ten thousands of ten thousands stood before him, and the judgment was set, and the books were opened, and beheld, uh, and, and I beheld then because of the voice of great words which the horn spake, and I beheld till, the, which would mean the Antichrist is coming very soon, if that's what that's referring to. And I beheld where the beast was slain, and the body was destroyed, and given into the burning flame, and concerning the rest of the beast, uh, they had dominion taken away, and yet their lives were prolonged for a time and season. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, uh, one like the Son of Man came within the clouds of heaven, um, and come and came to the Ancient of Days, again the return of Christ. And they brought him near before him, and there was given to him dominion and glory and kingdom in all the peoples, nations, languages, and should serve his dominion as an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that uh, shall not be destroyed. Uh, again, the return of Christ. And this is the beginning of the thousand years. It would, it would actually reign forever. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions troubled me. And I came uh, near to one of them that stood by and asked for the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of these things. These great beasts, which are, and here it explains basically what I said about them being four kingdoms. These great beasts are four kings which shall rise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Um, and then uh, I would know the truth of the fourth beast that was uh, diverse from all the others exceedingly, whose teeth were of iron and of, of nails and of brass, which devoured and break into pieces and stamped and risen to feet. This is Rome we're talking about. 
um, and the ten horns which came out of his head, or that were in his head, and uh, the other which came up which before whom three, three fell, even the horn that was full of eyes, and the mouth which spake very great things, whose look was more stout than all his fellows. I beheld the same horn, uh, made war with the saints, and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came, and judgment was uh, uh, given to the saints. Now, that could be, again, referring to the first return of Christ, um, that uh, until the ancient days came, and judgment was given to the saints, the Most High, and they came and the saints possessed the kingdom, referring how the, the, the Christians took over the Roman kingdom, or maybe both, it's also referring to the second return of Christ, um, and uh, a possibly future Antichrist as well. And so thus he said, the, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and tread it down, and break it into pieces. Certainly Rome did that in Western civilization. Um, conquistadors conquered, uh, you know, took over the whole world, and broke it down into political subdivisions and countries and so forth. Um, through, uh, you know, colonization and, and etc. And the ten horns out of the kingdom are ten kings that shall rise, and others shall rise after them, and shall be diverse from the first, and he shall do three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and, he sh and uh, they shall be given into his hand until times uh, and dividing of time. A time, times, and dividing of times. Three and a half years. But the judgment shall sit, um, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it uh, unto the end. And the kingdom and the dominion uh, and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High, uh, whose kingdom is everlasting kingdom, and the dominions shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for Daniel, my cogitations must, my cogitations much troubled me. <clears throat> I have to excuse me, I'm getting a little tired here, <laughs> but I want to get through this. And my uh, countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. So, again, a lot of allegory there about the, the, the future coming of Christ, um, which should happen very soon, uh, and, and some very uh, scary and, and wonderful events uh, on the horizon, as, as Christ comes to return for his bride. Um, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me. This is chapter 8 now. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, unto, uh, even unto Daniel, after which appeared to me, after the first, and I saw in this vision, and it came to pass that I saw, as I was at Shushan, which is, uh, again, a uh, Persian city, kingdom, in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, uh, I saw in the vision, as I was by the river Uli, um, then I lifted up my eyes, and then I saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram that had two horns, and the two horns were higher than, and one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last, and I saw the ram pushing uh, westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him, neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, uh, but there did according to his will and became, but he did according to his will and became great. Um, this uh, this is the Medo Persians, and as uh, with the, the the horns, the two horns, one higher than the other, again just like the bear with lift lifted up on one side. Sorry, my cat is stepping on the keyboard, so I apologize for that. Um, hang on one second here. I gotta correct this. <laughs> okay, so uh, I lift up my eyes and behold, and there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were, were high, but one was higher than the other. Again, the Medes and the Persians. And the higher one came up last, and I saw the ram pushing westward uh, uh, and northward, uh, and southward, so that uh, no beast might stand before him. This is the Greeks coming to the west, north, and south out of um, under Alexander the Great. Um, before him, and uh, neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And I was considering, behold, and as I was considering, behold, a, a goat came from the west uh, across the face of the whole earth. I'm sorry, the the the, the ram was pushing. That was a good, the Medo Persians. This is the, Gre the Greeks here. And I was considering, the, behold, a goat came from the west, uh, on the face of the whole earth, and touched not the ground, uh, and had a notable horn between his eyes. That's Alexander the Great. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I'd see standing before the river, and then ran unto him with his fury and his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with collar against him, and smote the ram, and break his two horns. So he broke the Medo Persian kingdom. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, and he was cast down to the ground and stamped upon him. Uh, this happened uh, during... Uh, getting back to our chronology here, during the reign of uh, Darius III, uh, Alexander the Great comes around uh, uh, during his reign and, and takes over the Medo-Persian kingdom. That's the end of the Medo-Persian kingdom. Um, therefore, the goat waxed very great, and he was very strong, and the great horn was broken. That's Alexander the Great. The great horn was broken, 
and from him came up four notable horns. These are his four generals. Um, and uh, from him came up uh, four notable horns um, towards the four winds of heaven. It was divided into four empires, uh, one of them being the Seleucids, um, which was the Greeks and the, the Northern Empire, and the Ptolemaics, which was the uh, Egyptian and the Southern Empire. And out of them, this is out of the Seleucids now, out of them came up a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great towards the south and towards the east and towards the pleasant land. This is the rise of the Romans. Uh, someone also suggested this is a, uh, analogous to Antiochus Epiphanes, which is another story, but that's it's possible that it's a dual prophecy there for both. Um, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven and cast down some of the hosts to the stars and to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, it magnified himself even against the prince of the host, that being Jesus Christ, um, and by him... The daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. Again, the Romans uh, destroyed the, sa the sanctuary in 70 AD. And a host was given unto him against the daily sacrifice by reason of the transgression, and it cast down truth to the ground, and practiced all that it prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking to another, saying to the other, uh, a certain one, which saith, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, under, uh, unto 2,300 uh, days, then the sanctuary, or actually it's 2,300 evenings and mornings, uh, is the literal translation, and then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And it came to pass, even when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought the meaning, that behold, there was still, uh, there stood before me a man, uh, the appearance of a man, and I heard the man's voice between the banks of the Uli, uh, which said unto thee, Gabriel, make, uh, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he had come, uh, came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall this vision be. Uh, now as he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, and he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee known and show uh, uh, what shall be uh, in the last end of the indignation, for at the time of the end shall the, uh, for the time appointed at the end shall this be. Um, the ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia, as we discussed. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, under Alexander the Great. Uh, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king, that's Alexander the Great. Now, that being broken, whereas four uh, stood up for it, uh, out of, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. These are the four kingdoms, we, these four generals that divided up um, after Alexander died. Um, Seleucus being the Seleucids, and then Ptolemy being the Ptolemaics uh, are two of them. And these are the kings of the north and the south that are fighting over Jerusalem. Now in his time, in the latter time of the kingdom, when the transgressions are come to a full, a king of fierce countenance shall stand up with dark sentences, uh, understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Again, Caesar, the Romans, but also possibly uh, anal analogous of the future coming Antichrist. Um, and in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressions are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance will uh, understanding dark sentences will stand up and his, and his power shall be mighty, um, but not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully. Now, it could also be possibly Herod, because Herod was put into place by the Romans, so that's another point to make. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and he shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Um, again, the Romans certainly did that. Uh, and through the policy, he shall cause to craft and prosper in, in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace he shall destroy many. Uh, Roman conquered as much by the Pax Romana as it did by its uh, legions of, of, of armies. Um, okay, and by by peace he shall destroy many. Uh, he shall also stand up against the Prince of Princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Um, the Prince of Princes, of course, is uh, Jesus Christ. Um, he shall stand up against him, but he shall be broken without hand. He wasn't conquered, Rome wasn't conquered by military might. Um, Rome was conquered not by might but nor by power, but by the Spirit of God. And through through Christians refusing to submit and willing to accept martyrdom and so forth, um, to the point where eventually they ended up uh, taking the kingdom of Rome uh, um, and turning it Christian. Um, and in the vision of the evening and the morning, which uh, was told is true, wherefore shut up the vision, for it shall be many days. And I Daniel fainted, and I was sick many days. And afterward I rose up and did the king's business, and I was and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Um, so that brings us to the uh, uh, chapter 9 of, of Daniel, which we already discussed earlier. Now, one thing I want to note here is that 2,300 days that he discussed for the time of the vision, uh, it says, Then I heard one saint speak another and said um, to the certain saint, 
How long shall the vision be concerning the sacrifice and the transgression and the desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he sent it unto me 2,300 uh, score days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, this could be referring to a couple possibilities here. Um, one could be the, the Jewish revolt, uh, a 2,300 little day period from maybe 66 all the way to Masada um, in uh, 73, 74 thereabouts. Um, but another possibility, because the actual uh, uh, terminology here is um, in the Hebrew is uh, 2,300 evenings and mornings. And uh, the evenings and the mornings is the, the, the movement of the zodiac, the circulation of the zodiac from uh, throughout its cycle from evening, evening to morning. Um, this could be referring to a year, a full year cycle, uh, for example, the sun to the zodiac. Um, so the 2,300 uh, days, uh, evenings and mornings could be 2,300 years which is very interesting if we consider that possibility because uh, Cyrus, or excuse me, not Cyrus, um, Alexander the Great began his conquest in 334 um, B.C. Uh, that's when uh, he began his march and uh, uh, started taking over the uh, Medo-Persian Empire. If we go, uh, th this, th this vision, according to the prophecy here, um, would last 2,300 evenings and mornings. It says, and then, and then I heard one saint speak to another and said to the saint, how long, um, um, how long that the certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression and desolation, giving both the sanctuary and the host which trod underfoot? This is a vision unto the time of the ends. Um, well, the vision, if, if the vision starts with the goat attacking the, the Medo-Persian uh, ram uh, with the one horn higher than the other, that vision historically would have started uh, in 334 BC when Alexander Great, the goat, goes and attacks the Persians, um, the Medo-Persians, uh, under Darius III. So if it starts in, in 334 and we're counting 2300 evenings and mornings, possibly analogous to 2300 years, let's see what happens when we subtract that. So we got 2300 years from the start of the vision. Uh, we have to add a year because there's no year zero. That brings us to the year 1967. Um, what happened in 1967 it says, How long shall be the vision of the daily sacrifice, the transgression, desolation, giving both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said, Unto be uh, 2,300 days, or evenings and mornings, and then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So after 2,300, uh, if we say that's years, 2,300 years, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So from the time of the start of the vision, with uh, Alexander the Great marching in, in 334 to 2,300 years later, we get the year 1967. What happened in 1967? That was the year that the nation of Israel uh, regained the Temple Mount for the first time after uh, uh, going back all the way to 70 AD in the, in the uh, time of ancient Israel, from the time that the sanctuary was first destroyed and trodden underfoot. Therefore, that would suggest that the times of the Gentiles are, are now being fulfilled with the reclamation of the Temple Mount. Again, the restoration of the nation of Israel, the, re the reclaiming of the Temple Mount, and then uh, the uh, other items I pointed out uh, showing the, um, the time frame for 6,000 years after the start of creation till the 1,000 year reign of Christ, the uh, 2,000 years from the time of cruci Jesus' crucifixion until the uh, possibility of his return, all of these begin to culminate at the same time, which tells us that we are definitely in the last days and Jesus is coming back very soon. And so therefore the events of Revelation are also about to happen and in our lifetime and so now more than ever is the time to get right with God and to know Jesus um, so that is the ultimate point for me to kind of go through this is because to let you know that the life the Bible is true uh, the historical account it gives is true and that Jesus is coming back very very soon and uh, we don't have a lot of time left um, to get right with God but we all need to be seeking him uh, and if you don't know him um, I endeavor you to please ask Jesus in your heart and know him because there aren't many years left here. Um, and he may even come a little bit sooner. He could come tomorrow. We don't know the day or the hour. But we do know the season because prophecy in the Bible is showing us that these final days are the, our generation and that these events are truly coming to pass. So that is the purpose of this video. Uh, if you have any questions on it, um, please feel free to leave a comment uh, or go to grailoftruth.com and uh, leave a comment there as well. Um, but I hope uh, you learned something from this. I know it's kind of a long video, um, but uh, hopefully you will. Uh, uh, this will endeavor you to seek God more and understand that we are very near, close to His return. And uh, hopefully um, you will take this as as a warning to to accept Jesus in your heart and, and to uh, accept His salvation because we don't have much time left. So 
praise God and and I hope you are blessed by this. And uh, uh, if you don't know God, please, as I said, ask Jesus in your heart. Ask him to be your, is uh, you ask him to be your Lord and Savior, because uh, um, the time is very short at hand. Thank you.